going and start whatever you like. Okay, then. Good evening, everyone. It's April 17th, 2023. This is the GBOS regular meeting. The Girdwood Board of Supervisors, its committees and subcommittees are subject to the Alaska Open Meetings Act as found in Alaska Statute 44.62.310 and Anchorage Municipal Code 1.25 public meetings. The Girdwood Board of Supervisors operates under the Girdwood Public Meeting Standards of Conduct. I'll call this meeting to order at 7.02 p.m. I'm Brianna Sullivan, co-chair, Parks and Recreation and Cemetery Supervisor. Also in the room are... Who left? Oh, Mika left. Um, Mike Edmonton, co-chair, Land Use Supervisor. Karen Wade, Fire Department. Jennifer Wingard, Roads. And Amanda. is... Go ahead, Sorry. Amanda. Amanda Sassy, uh, Public Safety. Thank you, everyone. Are there any disclosures this evening? Being and hearing none, there's also an opportunity to say it when the item comes up. We'll go to agenda revisions and approval. I would entertain a motion to approve April 17th's agenda. Uh, move to approve the agenda. Right. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second, go. Thank you, Guy. <clears throat> any other discussion on the agenda? We'll go by assent. Are there any objections to the agenda? Okay, the agenda is approved. I would entertain a motion to approve both March 27th meeting minutes and the April 10th meeting minutes. I move to approve the March 29th, uh, March 27th meeting minutes and the April 10th GBOS WC Joint Special Meeting Minutes. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second on the minutes? A second, that. Okay, thank you, Guy. Any discussion on the minutes? Go by assent as well on those. Are there any objections to either of the minutes being approved? Okay, hearing and seeing none, those minutes are approved. Go to announcements. And, oh, before I do, yes. Announcement. The public is encouraged to ask questions and provide comment. Please raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. To help discussion stay productive, please direct your comment to the board rather than other members of the public and keep your comments focused on the business under discussion. Please be respectful of everyone's opinions. And everyone online, please maintain your muted status and cameras off until you are called upon. And then please say your name. Everyone in the room, please come close enough to these microphones, which is in the middle of the aisle, so that everyone online can hear you equally. The announcement next is the final racial equity forum hosted by Alaska Humanities Forum it is scheduled for April 25th. That's Tuesday from 6 to 8 p.m. in this Girdwood Community Room. Also, GVSA is hiring. Seasonal Parks Caretaker 1 and 2 are now posted on the MOA jobs page. Also, DOT is conducting outreach for the Safer Stewart Highway Project. In the project website for details and provide comment comments end April 20th. So that is very soon and we were told that commenting now is the most beneficial before all the work gets started. Alaska Trails is seeking support for Alaska Long Trail projects for inclusion in the fiscal year 2024 state budget. Project list is available here on this link and information on how to provide comment is also provided here. Page. Going on to number one, introductions, presentations, and reports. Cyberbullying concerns. I could start or we have a uh, Tommy in the room. Would you like to come forward for the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, the uh, Public Safety Advisory Commission Committee um, is uh, is discussing um, a cyber bullying concerns as a public safety issue. There's a uh, police lieutenant from Homer who has a program that is outlined in uh, these two links on the first page of this uh, paper here. Um, and um, I've contacted him and we're starting negotiations for him coming to uh, Girdwood to do a presentation um, in October. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to make it mandatory. Um, that's, I'm being 
facetious somewhat. It, it's uh, in Homer, they've had uh, cyberbullying going on, and there have been two suicides, and um, also uh, child sexual violence and coerced um, related to cyberbullying. And the um, the school is doing a a program um, on May third that's going to talk about. Um, the internet, but this, uh, the Lieutenant uh, Ryan Browning's uh, talk is more to the point uh, of cyberbullying, and it's a concern, and we'd like to, um, the Public Safety Advisory Committee is going to vote on it on, at this next meeting, and we'll bring the um, a proposal to the Girdwood Board of Supervisors to see if you can um, help uh, support the cost of it. Um, the cost is uh, uh, Lieutenant Browning uh, driving up here, um, staying overnight, um, and his salary as a police officer. So we'll get more details on that as it comes up. One thing that he told me that was very chilling um, was that he said, you probably dealt with bullies uh, when you were growing up. I said, yeah, um, it, it's a common thing. Uh, he said that when he, he said when you and I were growing up, when we got home, and we'd be safe. And that's not the case anymore. Cyberbullying comes right into your house, and kids don't talk to their parents about it. It's a so this will help get it out in the open and, and make our kids more safe. So um, we'll tell you more about it. And uh, yep, just a quick question. So this is directed for something that would. Be presented here, yes. to parents or to yes. parents and kids and kids. Like, how old is Hardy? Thirteen. Yep. Yep. Mandatory attendance for you <laughs> and your son. But it'll be good. It's it's that one. Yes. Too. So it, it's, he uh, says he's very frank, and that's why he wants the parents to be there. And it will let you know. I mean, he talks about suicide and penises and vaginas, and you know, it's down to earth. Um, and he says that coming from a police officer, um, it makes more, it gives it more gravity than just the parent saying, well, you know, watch out. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's a good program and it's uh, worthy of our attention. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Any other questions? All I will add is that the, uh, talk that Tommy was referencing on May 3rd is being hosted by the Girdwood PTA, and that is, I believe, 6 p.m. on May 3rd. So if you'd like to find out more information on, about that, it's a tech talk night for parents, and uh, I would visit the PTA website or everywhere they post something. Anything to add there? We'll move on to number two, legislative report. Is Senator Kathy Giesel on? Hi, yes, I am on. Thanks, um, Brianna. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'll try to keep it short because I know you, I guess, always have a super long meeting. We just got the budget, the operating budget today from the House. Um, it is not fully funded, so the Senate will be working on that. Um, our funding, while the price of oil has gone up to the mid $80 a barrel now, we're still about 200 to $250 million short in funding this year's budget. Uh, so um, the Finance Committee will be working some magic there. Um, we are looking at future budgets being uh, difficult to fund as well. And so we're looking at new revenue sources, uh, which you may have heard about. Um, one is an increase in the oil taxes, uh, reducing the deductions that oil companies can make per barrel on the slope. Uh, also now putting in a tax, a tax in place, a corporate income tax for S corporations. So I know you guys know a, a C corporation is a publicly traded corporation. Uh, the state of Alaska taxes those folks at 9.4%, in fact. 
Uh, but our laws do not provide for taxing of S corporations. These are privately owned companies. Uh, I always uh, describe them as lawyers' offices, physician offices, you know, the LLCs that you see. Well, Hill Corp on the North Slope is an S corporation. It's owned by a single individual. I'm sure he has partners. But because we don't have a personal income tax in Alaska, we levy no taxes on Hill Corp. Um, so other than uh, we do get obviously royalty production tax from them, uh, things like that, but no corporate income taxes. So this is a, uh, there is a bill that will propose uh, taxing them. It won't bring in buckets of money. It'll bring in about 200 million a year. Um, if we do succeed um, with the uh, change in the deductions on, on oil, uh, it would bring in about a 500, well, 300 to 500 million dollars a year if we change uh, those deductions on a barrel of oil. Um, other things under discussion are internet sales tax, um, the education head tax uh, may be coming back soon. So uh, why do we need more revenue? Well, one of the things that's not included in the House operating budget is the increase in funding for the base student allocation, in other words, for K-12 education. This is a priority for the Senate majority. And uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, how to solve that riddle, how to get the BSA increased. Right now, the base student allocation is about $5,100 per student. If you adjust that for inflation today, it should be about $6,300 for every student. So you can see um, over the past about 15 years, uh, Inflation has eaten away at our education funding, uh, and so that's a problem. We need to uh, make that up so that we can uh, recruit and retain teachers. Another factor in recruitment and retention of teachers, public employees, the, the folks that plow our roads, issue permits, etc., cetera, is um, moving back to a defined benefit ben pension um, program. That's a bill, frankly, that I'm carrying. Um, it would reinstitute the defined benefit. Right now we have a defined contribution and uh, we have the data that shows when an employee is vested in the defined contribution, they then can take all the money that their employer has put into their retirement as well as all their own money, their own contributions, and they can pull it all out and leave the state. We see that happening. Um, with our public safety folks, firefighters, policemen. We see it happening with teachers. Uh, so that's um, another issue that we're, we're wrestling with. The other big one we're wrestling with is the dividend. So today in Senate Finance, uh, a bill was introduced that would set the dividend at a 25-75 split of the earnings. This would be a dividend of about uh, 1300 to 1400 for every man, woman, and child who qualify, but it would free up about $1.2 billion for state services, services like education, roads, public safety, etc. So um, this will be, again, an interesting discussion. The House itself uh, is more in favor of the 50-50 dividend, which would be about $2,300 for every man, woman, and child, but would not be sustainable even into next year. So those are the things we're wrestling with. Uh, not a lot of fun reports, but I'll stop there because I know you've got a lot more work to do tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Giesel. I have a quick question, and before I ask anyone else to, but the, the bill you said that you are working on specifically, what's the number of that one? It's Senate Bill 88. 88, okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, we have two online, and I didn't see who was first, but uh, Jerry, you have one, so go ahead, Jerry or Carol. Okay, so this is Jerry. Hi, Kathy. Thank you um, for your service. I work doing volunteer work, doing taxes for low individual, low income individuals and seniors. And one of the things that we find is that, you know, any child 
that has unearned income over $1,200 has to file an income tax or file it as part of the parent's tax. If somehow that portion of the permanent fund, like this year, of $665 was an energy rebate credit, if somehow the portion over $1,200 could be non-taxable or the whole thing non-taxable, it would be a lot simpler for us. But the big thing is it'd be a lot simpler for low income and the people through Alaska that are having to file taxes for their children. And, you know, the children are one, two years old and they have to pay $100 in tax, which doesn't quite make sense. So just think about how you could maybe use portion of it to be an energy rebate credit like this year or something, it would be great. And then just as a follow-up comment to the permanent fund, I know you're not supportive, but I'm supportive of a state income tax, you know, taking money out of the permanent fund and, and using it for state government as the most regressive tax we could have. But I know that's probably a non-starter. So thank you. Well, actually, Jerry, I'm evolving to uh, seeing the need for a personal income tax. Our majority caucus in the Senate uh, is not, we don't have the votes for that, but I'll tell you, I'm one of the people that is evolving to that point. We're simply uh, running out of money. One thing I didn't mention is that the permanent fund is not going to be spinning out the earnings that it has been for the past few years. That's about $4 billion a year. That's going to drop in half next year. Anyway, question number two. Go ahead, Soren. Yeah, hi, uh, Senator Giesel. This is Soren Worth, and I, as a teacher of nearly two decades in the school district, I really want to thank you for your advocacy for Senate Bill 88. Um, you know, working in the classroom every day, our classrooms are completely overcrowded, uh, and uh, um, we have teachers leaving the profession. Um, by uh, we have so many elementary positions open, middle and high school this year. We're having a hard time filling. Um, and we're going we're having to do double duty and I know, you know, all of this. So I just want to say, um, thank you for su your support, uh, on this education bill and we're hearing it loud and clear as teachers and educators. And I think our community and our parents, so we're, we're behind you. Thanks for that Soren. And, you know, we are losing population in Alaska and that is often due to the, the education challenges that we have. When education suffers, the whole economy suffers. We've got to fix this. Thank you. I don't see any other hands and any in the room, Senator Diesel, so thank you for your time today. Thank you. Is Wadi Shaw on there? Let's see him. Okay, so next on the agenda is assembly members. Is Randy Salt or Suzanne? Here. I don't see them, but I'll look for them. They sometimes come in later. Thank you, Kyle. And then mayor's office. No. Hey, Andy Holloman, you're up. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to thank Senator Giesel. She did a lot of what I would report on, although it's not on, not all of it school board business, but uh, really do appreciate her work on the, both the retirement issue and on the funding issue. Uh, both are having a critical effect and, and I'll just second what she said. We've had an unusually high number of teachers leave during this year, uh, which used to be really rare. Um, and it's a combination of things. It's not one thing by any means, but we also have a very high number of people that have turned in their paperwork to retire at the end of the year. Uh, recruitment is going to be tough and it's, it's going to be tough all over Alaska. It's going to be tough all over the country. So it's a kind of a perfect storm. Um, backing up, the main issue I think may be of interest to Girdwood. Uh, one, still waiting to hear about use of the Girdwood school building when the rest of Anchorage is closed. I suspect that's going around to every department. Um, for like review and consideration, including transportation, security, um, and in some cases there may be no issue, but I know they'll still check with each department uh, to think about that. Uh, and of course, considering what happens if you have some students that show up and some students that don't, um, it's, I know it seems pretty simple on the face of it, and it may be, but it may also be quite uh, a bit complex. 
but I will bring you whatever news I get as soon as we get it. Um, school start times are going to be looked at again, and um, that's something a lot of you may want to weigh in on, and I'm going to refer you to the website ASDK12.org. Click on Hot Topics, and it will take you to the presentations that have been made. It'll take you to all the combinations we will be looking at, which there's probably about a dozen. Um, <clears throat> the feeling is we, we won't really change the outcomes unless we swap elementary and high school. And the, the research shows that elementary kids start off energetic and they fade in the afternoon. Um, and that high school kids start off faded and build up energy as the day progresses. And of course, our start times right now are the opposite of that. Um, we, we start our elementary kids late um, and run them late. Uh, we start our high school kids early and release them early. Uh, this one, you know, primarily, I, th I think will come down to what the community indicates. Um, if if people do want the change and they do feel like it'll make a difference, um, that's what we want to do. Um, if it's if it's going to cause issues for so many people, we'll try to look at minimizing that. So I would urge people that are affected by it to go to the website and um, either email the board. I think there's a way for input and a survey at the website, um, but but do please pay attention on that one. Um, the legislative issues, funding is a big one. Um, they're continuing, they've, they've continued to hold hearings on the governor's bill about parental rights. Um, and of course, the defined benefit bill is in there. Again, if you have feelings, I would urge you to contact your legislators. Um, Senator Giesel expressed her position. If you support it, I, I would suggest an email uh, just so she knows that you support it. If you don't support it, she'd want to hear that too. And also Representative Shaw would need to hear your opinions on it also. So uh, I think that's everything I have and happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Andy Holman. Are there any questions from the board? Anyone online or in the room with questions? I have a quick question. Uh, the what's the timing on the decision for the start times? Um, nothing's going to happen this fall, and I don't know exact. I don't know that we've picked a time for a vote. Um, I think some of it will depend on what kind of feedback we get, and if there's a lot, uh, we're not in a big rush on it. We we want to get it right uh, rather than quickly, uh, but it. We already think it's too late to do anything for fall, so we would be talking about the start of school in 24, 25 at the earliest, so we've got a lot of time on this. It's not scheduled for a vote anytime right away. OK, thank you very much for your time and addressing uh, the topic on number five, so. Thank all um, of you. Thank you. If there's nothing else, we'll go to. No one else came on, Kyle. Um, supervisor reports. Let's start with uh, in the room. Mike, could you start? Um, yeah, um, I think we, I'll just mention something that happened at uh, the last uh, land use meeting. Uh, most of the agenda items are actually on our agenda tonight. But one thing of significance is uh, the land use adopted a, a land acknowledgement at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and uh, I would urge us as a body to maybe in a future meeting consider doing the same for uh, GBOS. Mike. Uh, Guy, do you have a report? No, I think, yeah, there are some agenda items later on. And Chief Weston will be here to speak during them. Okay, thank you. Later. Jennifer, have one? Um, okay. I don't have any updates. Okay. <clears throat> Amanda, do you have any updates? Um, I just to say that tomorrow uh, evening, the Public Safety Advisory Committee is going to Whittier's Community Council meeting to do a commemorative session event. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, for my report, I do not have anything other than what's on the agenda, I believe, or in Kyle's report. 
So we'll go with our service provider reports. Chief Weston, please come forward. This one. Happy endless uh, endless winter, or maybe meltdown. Um, hey, I just wanted to mention there was a post on social media uh, yesterday, I believe, that talked about um, being, people being roofied in the community. Um, we have not responded recently on any roofie events, but we have responded for EMS for those. Um, and it was mentioned that we had actually drug test kits uh, for that. Um, we actually don't at this time. Uh, we were given eight fentanyl kits. This is one of them. Uh, that's all we have at the moment. And this is for the issue that you're seeing in Massu. Uh, where uh, people who are getting meth, who are meth users, are having fentanyl laced meth, uh, and there's been at least six uh, overdose deaths in the last couple of weeks. So, um, this is one of the things you can use to test for those. Um, we only have eight at the moment, um, but, uh, and then I've given the rest of my Narcan kits that I have to patrol for the weekend. Um, uh, so, I'm going to try and get some more of those in right now. Um, with the fentanyl, um, if you uh, do have a loved one or a family member that's a user, a lover or a friend, um, with the fentanyl in the mass, um, it is taking at least two of the Narcan doses um, to get them out of it versus one. So, so know that it's it's quite very potent um, and usually you'll have to do that one time. But uh, I just want to give that sort of public service awareness uh, level. Um, and then for us, today's really an exciting day right now over there. I don't know if you can feel the stress level, um, but there's eight people writing their EMT one test. They're a mix of Alias Resort employees uh, and group of fire members, and this is their last thing they have to do. Oh, get closer to the mic. It's exciting news, so. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure everyone's. So, uh, so anyway, they're writing their test as we speak, uh, and they've already done their practicals. So as soon as they pass their test tonight, and they'll know instantaneously, we'll have eight new EMT1s in the community. So happy about that. Um, we did, we just finished uh, 48 hours of extrication training on our new extrication tools. So we are very excited about that. And then the second phase, which was the grant that the AK legislature gave us, Alaska legislature gave us, um, is also due to arrive. It's on the barge right now. Hopefully it doesn't sink. Uh, it's due to arrive hopefully within the week. And so next Tuesday, um, it's weird again. Oh, you stand over there and talk loud, it'll be good. Okay. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, by uh, by the, well, uh, next Tuesday, we'll have a press conference uh, to uh, thank everybody for those tools. It's hoping they arrive in time. Uh, and so um, our DOT grant gave us $112,000 worth of extrication tools. This uh, AP legislature grant gives us another uh, $312,000 of tools that are spread from us all the way down to Homer. Uh, and so we've really raised the bar with this $400,000 worth of extrication tools uh, on getting everybody up to speed on having uh, current extrication tools on the highway. We still have about $100,000 worth of needs between all the ourselves and the other 11 departments south of us. Um, but we're so much farther ahead than we were uh, last January. So super happy about that. So that, and then um, obviously going into this month, I was pretty freaked out looking at the uh, cruise ship schedule, knowing how many people are transiting through the service area and knowing that in June, it looked like six days a week, we're gonna have people moving through the service area, which for us translates into customers. Um, but I'm happy to say that we have uh, been able to staff up. And uh, I am looking at really good staffing for summer. Uh, we've managed to convince some, a couple of people to leave their normal jobs and come work for us uh, and who are existing members. And uh, so that's also good. So yeah, so feeling at least at the moment, um, pretty good about things for that. Uh, you know, might say, are we gonna have a fire season this year? Um, possibly. Uh, really, even though it looks like we got lots of snowpack, you really can't tell at this point. And so um, if you look at talking to the people that predict these things, we still might have uh, high fire danger for forest fair and things like that. Um, so uh, everybody should just know that even though it looks like we're in endless winter, maybe in a couple of weeks we might suddenly be in breakup. So, uh, or a real breakup. So um, yeah, any questions for me? Chief, I got, I got one about Narcan. So, like an EpiPen, typically you want to go to the doctor after you have an epileptic shock and use an EpiPen. Yeah. Is Narcan the same? Yes. 
So, so it'll just get you over the hump. Or... Our can, you stick it up the nose, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've got some, if you want to see what the one looks like, I have in my office a shape one, so you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, it goes up your nose. Um, at all the AEDs, we have in the community. I try and also put Narcan kits there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, with that, uh, you squirt it up the nose, know that it's going to wear off. So if you still need to call 911, it's going to get them out of the respiratory depression, but you still might, they might still go back into it. So, but the good thing to know is if it's hit, you know, you need to use more than you normally would. So use both of them, but then you need to call us because you know, a little while they're going to go back down again. So mm -hmm. they still need to be transported. Um, it's, you know, but you might have saved their life, which is huge. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Don't see any questions mm -hmm. online okay. either, Chief Weston. Okay. So thank, thank you. you very much for your report. Uh, okay. Trial. Uh, please, Chief O'Shea is on the line. I see. Welcome, Chief O'Shea. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a quick recap. Uh, after the last uh, GBOS's uh, Public Safety Advisory Commission meeting, um, they were talking about some traffic issues and stuff like that. So we uh, increased our a little bit of our traffic enforcement in the Girdwood area. Uh, the other next event coming up is a slush cup. Uh, during the slush cup time, we're going to have we've increased staffing. Based pretty much all our officers going to be working that weekend, so they're going to be anywhere from uh, two to four officers on duty at any given time. Uh, in the uh, Girdwood proper area. Additionally, uh, I ch actually chatted with APD earlier today. They're going to be increasing their traffic enforcement and uh, on the Seward Highway uh, during that weekend, as well as I was advised that uh, currently, I uh, guess, uh, they're going to be sending a couple officers into the Al Eska Resort area. Uh, they were asked for a separate contract to uh, do some traffic control for the Al Eska. Uh, they asked, just wanted to know what our opinion, and we had no opinion of it. It's great to have extra officers in that area, but that's going to be a separate contract <coughs> between Alaska Resort and APD. Other than that, uh, for this uh, Slush Cup weekend, we're looking forward to that. Like so we're going to have uh, extra officers on duty uh, during the whole weekend. So we'll have a total of uh, six officers uh, for that weekend in Girdwood. Uh, other than that, if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, ask. And uh, I also just for Chief Weston, uh, if you want, we probably have a couple of extra Narcan kits. If you'd like, we could go and drop it off at the fire station. Uh, if if your personnel needs it for your uh, on duty personnel for uh, the weekend. Uh, oh, Chief, Chief, it's Michelle. Um, no, we're probably okay. We've got our own Narcan. I just, you know, I'm just trying to push it out into the community of places that I think that it needs to be. So, okay. Thank you. No problem. And we're also looking forward to tomorrow night uh, at the Whittier City Council. Uh, Girdwood Board of Supervisors, Public Safety Advisory Committee will be in attendance for the ceremonial signing of our Girdwood contract. Uh, during that time, we'll take them, uh, take them to a quick tour of our facility here in Whittier and answer any questions they may have. Thank you. Thank you, Chief O'Shea. Are there any questions from the board or members of the public? Thank you for being here and all of your service. Hey, it looks like Parks and Rec, Kyle and Rose, Rose first. Sure. Um, yeah, well, last week we thought we we're still in winter and this week it looks like uh, spring has taken hold. So uh, we're actively uh, getting ready for that and dealing with what melts out. Uh, but uh, we are still grooming Nordic trails. Our volunteer crew out there through the Growing Nordic uh, uh, Ski Group have done a great job of uh, trying to keep up with it. Um, probably only if, uh, maybe a week or more left of grooming before the snowpack really starts to fall apart and becomes too hard to do that. Um, but we really want to thank our volunteers who have put a ton of time in there. And also a huge thanks to Shane Bullen, who's been our expert on a mechanic um, and done that all volunteer time for, for the club and for the park, keeping machines running really well. So uh, that's worked out really good. Uh, we are definitely shifting gears towards summer um, and preparing for projects and things along those lines. And one of the main things that we're focusing right now is interviewing to um, uh, seasonal positions. And so we've had um, uh, a few interviews so far, but we're still seeking applicants for those positions. Um, and they're basically 40 hour a week positions. We do shifts either four tens or four or five eights. And um, it, it goes from May through September uh, in that aspect. But uh, we are flexible with people's schedules, understanding that we do sometimes have people who are still in school and need to leave early. So it's so over that. And our campground hosts are set for this uh, uh, this year. Uh, 
Kara and Jared, uh, they'll be staying there and, uh, and uh, doing the work for us out there. Um, working through several projects, I said, like I said, working on a map project, uh, memorial benches, um, and then uh, we had a huge fundraising effort from um, for the baseball field, and seventeen thousand dollars was raised, um, and uh, we are applying that towards doing improvements to the field this year, trying to really improve that and make that a better surface for playing on, and then also working on a batting cage. Um, so uh, we'll be working on those improvements over the coming weeks, but we thank everybody who volunteered for that effort and raised those funds for the Slayton Bowl uh, Memorial Field out there, uh, which is really great. Um, we are currently also planning for trail projects. Uh, we're working with Alaska Trails to have them here for a total of three weeks. Uh, there'll be actually three different crews that come through and uh, they're gonna be working on projects for the lower Diderod and the middle, excuse me, the lower Beaver Pond and the middle of Diderod um, and getting quite a bit of work done there. Uh, so we'll be doing that. And then once we do get our full-time summer crew, they'll be working on trail projects through that. As well, GTC is working up volunteer efforts for each month for GTC uh, Guru Trails Committee volunteers to go out and do brushing and uh, evening projects. So we'll be starting those in June, um, probably have one or two in June and probably one or two in July um, outside of the Forest Fair and Fourth July holidays. Uh, so we're working through that. So, and then we're also updating a new trail map um, that we'll be using. Our trail maps that we have are probably close to 15 or 18 years old. And um, so we're updating those and uh, and we have a committee and we'll be meeting this Wednesday with that committee about that trail map pro uh, program. And then the Gerwood Trails plan uh, is moving along what we call the Blue Candidate Draft. Um, and we'll be going before HLB the Heritage Land Bank Advisory Committee um, at the end of the month and seeking a letter of support from them. And then we'll start the process with planning to go through P planning and zoning for approval and to get that planning adopted. So uh, working through that, we'll be making a presentation to uh, the Advisory Commission uh, at the end of the month there, as I said. Um, as always, Margaret does a great job of keeping our um, website and, and information up to date so if you're looking for information you can try there or otherwise give us a call we'll help you find it and then lastly the hand tram uh, replacement with the new suspension bridge uh, we're all ready to go and get started with the design supposedly the assembly is reviewing it tomorrow and hopefully we'll approve it and then we will be able to get started so we've just been held up with these purchasing requirements and assembly approvals the new ones um, for over a month and a half and hopefully tomorrow is the last hurdle and we can get going on that and have a design done by the fall. And we're also working with the Forest Service closely on the approach to um, uh, construction. We may do it through uh, the missile process, which has been our plan, or we may work with the National Forest Foundation to have them lead it um, and figure that out. It's just a matter of how we can funnel the money to the different um, organizers doing it. The National um, Forest Foundation does several projects and they've done several bridge projects um, and they're more streamlined. So it may be a good approach for us to go that direction. So, so we're working that out. Um, switching gears over to uh, streets. Um, yes, the last two weeks really played sort of havoc on us with going from uh, Thaw back to Stowe, then we get a foot and a half and then we're back to Thaw. Um, but the road crew has been out there steadily trying to keep up with the peel as the ice layers built, uh, melt out. They're trying to peel it off today. They worked heavily on airport side and up uh, near the resort, really also preparing roads to widen them because we know there'll be an impact with slush cup. Um, so they're they're preparing those areas. And then they got over the timberline today and tried to hit the hardest areas. They'll be back over there tomorrow. And we just as the dirt gets exposed, the potholes come out and we try to get the water going in the right direction. Um, and you have to do it when it's thawed. So there's just, it's just, it's a process. So we just ask people to be patient as we go through breakup. We're in the midst of it right now, but things will get better and uh, they'll continue to work on it as as uh, conditions allow. Um, major project, uh, it looks like uh, we are prepared to move forward this summer on one of the three fish culverts. Um, and I'll be talking with GPS in more detail about this at our um, work session. Um, uh, about the year in review uh, and more details to share, but I think we have the funding to get those done. They've been sitting on the shelf waiting to go for quite a while, and I feel this is the year that we can get one of them done with Western. Western's proved that they can do uh, fish culverts very well, and they've given us a uh, quote that's uh, right within what the engineer estimate is, so we're going to push forward and try to get that one done this summer. And that will be the one at Lake Tahoe, which drains Moose Meadows. Um, that is a complicated one because we have to lower the water line um, because the new culvert going in the fish fish meat fish specs 
has to be deeper. And so um, that just makes it more expensive, but it is what it is. And uh, we've designed for it and we're ready to go to get it done. So, uh, so we're working on that uh, this year. We'll talk more about that in our work session. Uh, as for expenses, uh, we're right within where we should be at this time of year. 11% uh, so far spent for road expenditures. That's because we have invoices that haven't been paid yet for March. And then um, our parks are right within it. We're always uh, low on our expenditures this time of year. We start spending uh, quite a bit more of our budget once we get into summer. And then uh, police and fire are right where they need to be. So overall, the budgets for 23 uh, look are looking good. So nothing unusual to report this time. I'll take any questions. If anybody has any. Thank you, Kyle. And Jennifer. Uh, Kyle, just real quickly, the um, that grant for the rehab of the Arlborg bike path, that something like that be a possibility for the issues that we're having along um, Alieska Highway, or is because that's DOT's mess? That's a different thing. The different thing. So we're not an owner of that, so we right. couldn't apply for it. DOT could apply for it. I think we encouraged them to apply for it, but it wasn't a priority for them. Okay. So, so yes, that's why we we focused on the Alberg path. Right. Okay. Any other questions from the board or members of the public? Okay. Thank you, Brad. Oh yes, one, Mike. One small thing. I think the um, I think we discovered that the um, the money transfer for the Antran placement bridge. Uh, one of the in tomorrow's meeting that will be in the following weeks we're meeting up on the 25th, is that correct? Yes. Oh, I didn't hear that. It's not on the agenda. It, we couldn't see it on the agenda, but it looks like it's going to be introduced in the following week. Okay. Suzanne confirmed it's suggested for the 25th. Gotcha. We will uh, discuss that tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mike. Okay. Moving on to public comment. Persons offering public comment must state their full name and address. Public comment is limited to three minutes and uh, not on subjects on the agenda. Is anyone here for public comment tonight? Please come forward to the microphone that's yeah, right here. Right here. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So um, my name is Linda uh, Mancock. I'm with the Girdwood Health Clinic. And so I'm here just to inform the community about Medicaid unwinding. It's a nationwide event that is uh, started the 1st of April. It's going to affect a lot of low income people who have that coverage. And so, uh, first of all, what is Medicaid? Medicaid is a federal uh, program which is administered by the state for uh, its health care for low income people who meet the eligibility requirements. So, um, Medicaid enrollment increased at the onset of the pandemic. and for many reasons, due to loss of work, less hours, and of course, illness. Um, and due to the public health emergency, Medicaid provided a continuous enrollment process, which meant that there would be no interruption for people's coverage during that uh, public health emergency. Um, but the public health emergency ended March 31st. And so on April 1st, the uh, Medicaid started to unwind. What that means is that every individual that's on uh, Medicaid is going to be reviewed and um, considered if they are still eligible. So um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services require every state to be prepared for this. And the way they're doing that is to partner with uh, clinics and other organizations like 211 and um, to help people um, address that renewal process, and if they're not eligible to have other um, insurance coverage for them, like the marketplace or a uh, sliding fee discount programs and stuff like that. Um, at any rate, so it's very important for these recipients to be updated with the Department of Public Assistance with their information, because it begins with notice that they are need to be reviewed. It's going to be happening over the course of a year. So when someone receives that notice to be reviewed, it's very time sensitive. So we encourage people to contact the Department of Public Assistance, and I'll give that phone number in just a moment to make sure that their contact information is up to date. We suspect a lot of people will most likely lose coverage because they simply cannot be contacted um, or you know, there's always language barriers. And for those who are homeless, who are 
most often on Medicaid. Um, the estimate nationwide for people to lose coverage is between 5 and 14 million people who will not be able to um, be covered and not be able to transition to another coverage. Um, the number of people without health insurance could increase if people lose that coverage. And the people who were covered dropped. Um, we were at a record low of 8.6% of people who were uncovered in 2021, which is due to the pandemic, which um, was only matching the historic low in 2016, which of course was the Affordable Health Care Act and the expansion of Medicaid. What is the Girdwood Health Clinic doing? We are uh, raising awareness through outreach, informing, educating, educating patients on the renewal process, assisting patients who lose their coverage with other uh, coverage. And then we're also assisting them if there's appeals, because if they lose their coverage and they shouldn't have, we're going to appeal on their behalf. So the number to call the Department of Public Assistance, 1-800-478-7778. That is a number that no matter where you are in the state of Alaska, that's the number to call. Oh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you <laughs> very much for being here and making that. All right. Uh, next online, Crystal Polk. Hi, everybody. Uh, Crystal Hoke, 1134. I just wanted to um, give an update. I, I apologize, I missed uh, Senator Giesel's update, so I'm not sure if this get, um, got addressed already, but uh, this is in regards to the Little Bears um, re replacement new facility. Uh, we did submit a, um, a grant request through uh, the state of Alaska to the Community Innovation Grant, which was specific, specific to childcare. Um, the, it, it, did, it excluded uh, new construction, so uh, our request involved, but planning was allowed. So our our request included um, the costs for architectural and engineering and um, planning, uh, you know, costs associated with the planning department. So, um, anyways, we did receive uh, letters of support from Four Valleys Community School, Girdwood Rotary. Um, uh, Girdwood Lions Club, um, and then Little Bears, of course, um, and uh, also Pomeroy uh, Lodging uh, provided one as well. So we provided five letters of support from various community organizations that um, were submitted last Friday. So we are hopeful uh, we'll see some of the funds. They've got nine and a half million statewide uh, for that grant. Um, so I just wanted to give a follow up and we're working hard to um, get all the funding we need to complete the project. Thank you so much. Thank you for your updates. Are there any other public comments this evening? I saw another hand up, but I do not. Here's Eric. Oh, Eric. Yeah, um, my name's Eric Flora, and uh, I I work for Alaska Pacific University, and I've been uh, operating the Cross Country Ski Training Center on Eagle Glacier um, for the last 17 years, and I wanted to uh, just come on tonight and share that um, we're going to be doing some construction up there this summer. Uh, the building's been up there for about 37 years and, and uh, it was damaged in the earthquake in 2019. And so with, with the help of the state of Alaska and FEMA, we're going to be doing some projects up there to kind of put the building into a, a good operational place and safety. And um, if for those that that uh, that aren't familiar with the center, it's it's the um, Cross Country Ski Center that, you know, we work with the cross country skiers, the, the ones that show up on, on the Olympics and, and World Cup list. Thank you very much, Eric, for the announcement and being here. Which month does that begin? Uh, that should be um, starting, the work will be starting in June. Okay. And uh, our, our goal is to work through the summer and have things buttoned up as winter starts. Thank you. Okay, any other public comments tonight? He's hearing seeing none. We'll go on to first item of old business, which I don't think. 
Number five, uh, we already I'm addressed by Andy Holloman. And I'll move to number six, update on current status of Alaska Highway Interchange Project. Road Supervisor. I don't have an update on that. I have not heard back from DOT. Okay. Any questions? Should we table that until we hear an update on that, or you want to keep it on there? No, let's table it. I'll let you know if I have anything. Yeah, I'll let you know too. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Number seven update on Holden Hills questions. Land use supervisor, I could read the whole thing or. Let's uh, start the first one. So um, we might combine a couple, but let's start with the first one. Um, yeah, so uh, we had a uh, letter drafted in the in the packet here, page two, um, which has at least one typo in our realize, probably many. Um, and I think that, that's a kind of starting point for some specific questions to um, Dr. Wilbur with an E by you. Um, so what this covers is, well, I can either read it or let you read it. I'll summarize it. Um, so after the decision to indefinitely postpone the action on the Holt Hills land disposal um, and comments from uh, Lance Wilbur at the HLB Advisory Commission meeting in March, um, there's still a number of questions and clarifications we're looking at. We have a meeting scheduled next Monday um, on April 24 uh, with the team municipal manager, I think still. So it's been concurred. Um, so what we want to do basically is send in this letter to prepare the questions and hopefully can bring answers to that meeting and then we'll, uh, we'll have a live discussion during that meeting. Um, so the the first one is about the status of the development agreement. What's the actual status now? Um, what's their intent for it? Um, they intend to keep it active. Do they intend to actually do more land disposal, et cetera, et cetera? So that's really a question of what, what is the intention of the uh, project and the whole hills project as it stands now? What can they do? What are they going for? What are they likely to do? Um, what the status is of the previous contracts with uh, C1 Investments and Dow for activities around the whole hills project? Are uh, they still active? How much money has been spent, etc.? Um, the status of the replatting action or the platting action uh, for those original three HLB tracks. Um, I've been told that it takes about uh, six months to a year to do the section line easement um, vacation. Um, and uh, obviously, we're not that far into the process. So, uh, again, we, we want to find out what's going on there. Um, what the status of is of any other work um, related to um, the original RFP by Pomeroy. So we've heard about this bifurcation, but it's not clear if it's formal or informal. So we want to get an update on that, what actually happened, whether there's any documentation around it. Um, and uh, in particular, um, if there's been any work on Aliaska Village from HLB side. So they're the main questions. And then the few specific requests um, are uh, getting a getting basically an unredacted original RFP. Uh, a lot of the material redacted has been released in other forms. So we want to get the original one, including that. Um, and uh, and also a termination of the uh, development agreement to remove any uncertainty about use of that land for other projects. Thank you, Mike, for going through the letter and for your work on this and for you, I believe. So, uh, I don't have any suggested edits, and I heard your first one was just spelling. Yeah, uh, uh, Lance Wilber's last name is W-I-L-B-E-R. Okay. You are on the top. So fixed. Yeah. Are there any comments from the board? Start with Jennifer. Or Amanda. Oh, you're oh. Sorry, Amanda. No, I saw you. I think you're in Okay, okay. all right, all right. Um, I didn't catch this earlier on the um, second bullet point when it talks about the, when you're talking about the funds that have been made to the contractors or what funds, blah, blah. I, I, I think that is one of the interesting questions, but uh, I think we might want to elaborate on that. And the other one is that out of whatever funds have been spent, what did we receive for that amount? What is the scope of the work for offsite improvements at estimated cost? So, in other words, if we've spent public money on something, what is our public product that we've gotten out of it? Right. 
Yeah, and what are we so some additional comment? What have we, yes. what have yeah. we, what have we, what's been spent, what's been received? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that earlier. Yeah. So that bullet point is first a statement, but then it's um, yep. followed with a question that will then be. Two part question or, yep. or two separate. I'm going to suggest a change. So what services have been provided by the contractors and um, funds expended to or invoiced or made anticipated to be paid? So what services have been provided by and funds have been expended under? Provided by and yeah, one service has been provided by those contractors and funds expended funds expended in waste or anticipated pay. Mm -hmm. And any results in documentation. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, while that gets written out by one of you, Amanda, your hands up. Thank you. I just think that they I think I heard that they uh, announced that the uh, city manager is not long, no longer acting, um, but is now officially the manager. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that it's his uh, document. And I think it's stick with acting because he will not. He's still acting until he's confirmed by the assembly. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Any other comments, suggestions? Um, this is so the intent is to send this to um, to the director after this meeting, and then we'll start with these questions. You may still have questions, or we may have answers that are provided for the um, the meeting next month. <clears throat> but uh, this is kind of a pre warning. Really. Anything else from the board? Okay. Uh, one hand is up before we go to the because item number seven does have have more sections to it. Soren, do you have a question on the letter or a comment? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure this might come in the following um, section. I can't see it. Um, but uh, is um, would this be the time to ask about the uh, Crow Creek area plan? And I'm just wondering what's going to happen with that if it's been updated. If there's a plan to update that or it's on um, number. Seven. Eight. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. So, hey, okay, number eight. Uh, Grace, do you have one for number seven? I do. Um, I think the the language you're asking for or seeking is that you need to be asking what the scope of the um, sole source contract was was uh, was asked of, and what is the deliverable been at this moment. Because we have two sole source contracts, one done in December 21st of 2021, and the second done in March of 2022, to two different parties, but with the oversight of CY Investment under the pretext of Holton Hills. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I think what I'd do there is uh, just provide the. Um, I think the scope is actually under the um, the original. Videos. So, um, or ARs, I can't remember ARs, I think. Um, I can provide those references. Just add that into the language. Okay. So, by previous source, source contracts, we'll just put the two references. Right. Anything else on this one, the letter? Okay. Um, I'll just comment on the one thing this does not cover um, directly is the, the issue about the sewer line. Um, that I think is another question for the municipal manager, but not necessarily to Lance, because I think that comes out at AWU. So that's still a topic for our meeting, but it's not necessarily under the scope of this letter, just in case anyone was wondering why that was missing. Okay. Uh, let's, um, know if we have to vote, but as a motion, I'm just going to, um, with the, I think, the amendments to the spelling of Director Wilbur's name and uh, the second bullet point, um, a move that we send this letter as written and while as amended. Thank you. We have a motion to submit this letter as amended. Do we have a second? Awesome. 
Okay, thank you, Jennifer and Amanda. Do we have any further discussion? Okay, uh, hearing no further discussion, Kyle, could you do a roll call? Sure. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes by zero. Thank you. Back to you, Mike, for the next motion of week seven. Yeah, so I think the thing that was missing here was the sewer line. Um, what I proposed there is we uh, we just have that as a specific question that we ask at the meeting and that we request. I don't know, you know, when we come when we come to the discussion later, we'll just put pain as a specific point, and then whether um, it's up to the manager whether he wants to call uh, someone from AWU just answer it himself. Okay. Okay. Great. And then. Next part is number seven. What was it like? Nothing. Going to number eight. Okay. Agenda item LUC 2303-06. LUC recommendation for GBOS letter request to HLB and assembly to abandon the unusable the 2006 Crow Creek neighborhood land use plan as the use as a master plan for development and request an update to the PCN LEP following completion of the Girdwood area slash comprehensive plan. So we already touched on number seven and number eight is just this one that's in front of us now also. So yes, I number eight is in the form of resolution around the letter. So we had a, in our last resolution on Fulton Hill, we specifically mentioned um, the Crow Creek neighborhood land use plan. Um, that we would, it, it was a, I can't remember the exact but it's, um, and I've had it before. It's not front of um, We mentioned it and uh, kind of objected to the to the use of it as a, um, as both a neighborhood plan and a area master plan. Uh, this resolution is a little bit more detailed um, in the problems of using them in both capacities. Um, and then also is more general that uh, any if no, nothing should be basically what we're saying here is none of them, no plans, no active plans and good should be used for both. They are, they're either one or the other need to be determined to be one or the other. Um, and uh, and then we specifically uh, call out. Um, we call out some specific problems with uh, this situation uh, using them both. Here. So I could go through this or uh, I could let people read it and uh, answer any particular questions. One thing um, that um, we realized you suggested by Jennifer was uh, some language we've changed in the uh, last whereas. We're just putting unanimously in there for land use. Normally what we do is record any land use action preceded this that generated this, uh, uh, this particular resolution. In this case, there was a unanimous vote. Thank you, Mike. And all of us did have uh hopefully opportunity to read through this. So if anyone needs more time, that's fine to do that now. I don't think. Jennifer, go ahead if you have something. Yeah, I want to see if we could discuss as a board, just making sure that this letter does match the intent of the LUC vote. Because um, again, I think I might have missed that. We're missing a little something. And in particular, it's the part where it says request an update to CC and LUP following the completion of the slash completion. I don't think we have that in there. So uh, which where what number where else is that? Oh, sorry. So I'm looking at under agenda nine item number eight, where it says this is what the LUC recommendation was. Uh, part of that recommendation says we're requesting an update to the corporate neighborhood land use plan. And I don't know if we, I think we might have accidentally missed that in the letter. Oh, did we get it? I, oh, I'm reading, I thought it was a dress. Oh, there we go. Yes, yeah, already right, missed it. But I thought it was reading really slowly. It's very no, clear. Got it. So so it's I missed it. Sorry. For us. So it is a, the final grass. Yeah. Okay. Eighth, eighth whereas. Um, there's two two sections in square brackets. Um, that was actually because I think when I sent it, I wasn't 100% sure. The first one is in the one, two, three, four, fifth. Whereas 
I couldn't remember if it was 2011 the sewer line was put in. So that's just a fact check. If it was 2011, let's just remove the brackets and let's just correct it to have the right date in there. Okay, so be my one amendment. The next bracket. Um, and I, this, this language I just didn't like, but uh, I don't know if anyone has a better suggestion. I think it works without that square bracket. Yeah, it's just good to right. Yeah. Right, say strike it. Yeah, yes. yes, let's do that. So my amendment then is to, um, well, I guess we should first of all move. First of all, I will move this resolution. Okay, the resolution has been moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. Jen for second, okay. And then um, I would like to uh, move an amendment that we, if we can confirm it was 2011, we just re remove the square brackets in the fifth whereas. Uh, if it's not 2011, we fix the right date, and we remove the uh, section in square brackets in the first, in the second, sorry, in the first resolve, in the first therefore. All right. Do we have a second on the amendments? Ten for seconds. Any further discussion on those amendments? Okay. We have a roll call for those amendments. For the amendments, yes. Uh, Brianna Sullivan. Yes. Uh, Mike Edgington? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Uh, that amendment's passed 5 0. Okay. Any other suggestions or amendments to the resolution? Okay. Hearing seeing none, uh, we can go back to the original motion. Any further discussion on this? Thank you very much for your work on it. Um, so we had a second on this. Can we do a roll call as well for this? Sure. Um, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Gessington? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Wingard? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. That resolution as amended passes. Everyone. Um, yes, that completes number eight. All right, number nine, agenda item LUC 2303-07. LUC recommendation to hold a formal strategic planning facilitated workshop to set goals for a formal subcommittee to address long term housing. So, um, I'll start this. I think the way I see, I see this kind of situation a little bit differently, I think, to the way Land just uh, discussed it. So, I'm going to describe how I see it and then we can discuss what we should do after. So how I see it is we have um, for housing, we have kind of four different things, four different strands, word strands to um, to consider at the moment. And one of them is kind of what's a long term vision, and that's actually being worked up. That's being worked and we already have a draft for it under the, um, the Goodwood area plan. So the things, the three things we still have to look at are um, we have this kind of high level goal coming from the area plan. Um, and then turning that into things which can actually be done, the implementation is a kind of technical project. It's a planning project. Um, and that piece of work in most other communities, they call it a housing implementation plan, something or a housing action plan. Um, but it's basically going from the ideas to a set of things that actually you know, make a difference in the, on the ground. So um, changes in code, uh, policies, different, you know, creating different entities, whatever it might be. There's a, there's a set of actually act, of actions, a plan for a set of actions which came there. And that's kind of a three to five year. Well, I mean, not to, to put a plan together is probably a one year project, but you know, the intent is that has that, you know, that will have a big effect in the sort of three to five year time scale. We have two other things which are shorter term. Um, one of those is uh, this opportunity that's pretty much ahead of us now. Of um, HLB is trying is identifying land that could be used for um, affordable attainable housing um, in the relatively short term. By short term, I mean you know maybe this could be two years, um, two or three years. Um, so I think we need we need some we need to focus on that. And the other thing we really need to, it's not discussed as much, but the other thing we also need to focus on is even shorter term than that. Is there anything we can do right now? Are there any things we can do to either change code immediately or Put some sort of you know exclusions around code or land use code or something else 
to find temporary housing we can can, can be used for um, workforce in you know next winter and definitely next summer. So are there things we can do in the six to twelve month time scale? So I think that very short term, what can we do kind of immediately that can affect next winter, and how do we uh, work with HLB to um, or how do we work with that identified with HLB and the other entities around that, so other nonprofits, etc. Um, those are two uh, those are two tasks that are kind of right in front of us now, and I think what we can do there is do something similar to the um, Triple H A C and put together a uh, committee to focus on those two questions, and uh, that would give them a you know probably six months to a year's work um, focusing just on that. And we should be able to do that under uh, under our Proposition 7 powers, which we don't technically have, but uh, will be in place by hopefully when it's certified on April 25th. So what I would propose is we have a, um, is we start or thinking about what that committee should be like um, and, you know, come up with a specific scope for those two tasks um, and have that as a 12 month, 12 month committee. And then something would follow that. Now, meanwhile, we have this housing action plan, housing implementation plan off to one side, and I think that's going to take a little bit longer to work out how we fund it and um, and how that ties in with uh, the community in general. But I think we can separate out these very short term things that need to be worked on immediately with things that need to be worked on over the next uh, sort of several months. Thank you, Mike, for starting us on this conversation and. Uh, Laying out all those options. Um, any comments first from board? Jennifer? This question. Yes, sorry. Just to make sure I'm absolutely clear. Could you just repeat the two tasks? Yeah, I think the two tasks are right in front of us that we could we could uh, have a committee working on kind of, you know, in a few weeks are the very short term things of what can we do um, that can basically create temporary housing or allow temporary housing to be used that provides a a bridge between now and having something, um, having lower cost housing available in the community in the two to three year time scale. So the, the first thing is, what can we do now? Um, and then the second task is that two to three year time scale of HLB has been given the um, task of identifying land which could be you know, transmitted to a either a local nonprofit or a local nonprofit partnering with another nonprofit. Nigeria nonprofit uh, to build attainable housing or affordable housing, um, and I think that having some part of a our sort of formal PBOS body looking at that from our perspective is uh, is the other task. So there are really two deliverables. One is recommendations. You know, hopefully by the summer they'd have recommendations on changes we can make now to help for next winter and next summer, and then in the probably six, you know by the fall they'd have fall or end of the year. That have recommendations for uh, working with HLB for what we have to do on that side. Okay, so forgive me, but short version is now question mark and three to five years question mark. Uh, for that for that committee, it's actually now and two to three years. Two to three. Years. Yeah. Okay. And then there's the separate thing of putting together a housing action plan, which is a three to five year. That that has most impact in the three to five years time scale. But that project itself is probably a one year project. It just cannot start immediately because we need to fund it. For this committee. Or not for this committee. Not for that committee. I think that's a broader question and probably would involve a wider, you know, a wider selection of the community in general. Although it might be something we fund. Okay, so quick clarification question. When we're talking about what like temporary housing and that uh, range, are we ask are we looking for specifically workforce housing or are we looking for anything along the range? I think that's a good question. We need to, as a body, we need to either decide or give that committee the task to first of all identify what is feasible. Okay. Done. Just so I'm clear, the, this recommendation from Land Use Committee is a recommendation for Land Use Committee and GBOS to get back together and hold a formal workshop. Are we talking a community wide formal workshop? I think the um, I think that the recommendations coming from land use was something closer to a community wide workshop, but I they identified it. several different things, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the thing we was voted on. So I think we have to look at it a little bit more holistically about what are all the things we need to do and how can we achieve them. 
you know, if, if, as efficiently as you can within government. All right. And I would just add that there are lots of ideas and they're all great ideas, but if we could compartmentalize them into the short term, which it's very soon agency is supposed to come to Girdwood or their next meeting and, and announce their identification of certain land that would be uh, best suited for low income or affordable or attainable identity housing, whatever they call it. And then uh, what we could have a committee do with that information right away and without that information, but knowing that information is supposed to be coming. And then the three to five year would be the action plan and that committee could be forming meanwhile or take longer to start because it would be fun. Yeah, there are these two. The, the actual plan is a separate thing from the what we're going to, whatever we're going to call this thing that will not be. Yeah, they could stem <laughs> from that <laughs> very much so. But, um, because that had so much, it still has a lot of momentum and energy and people are interested and have comments and concerns and want, want that something is being started and acted on. So in the short term, we could make um, So what Go ahead. okay, so if, if this if there's if there's kind of general support for this idea of to, to focus on have an ad hoc committee to focus on the shorter term issues, um, then I think what we should do is the similar similar approach to what we did with Triple H A C um is um, is basically decide on the scope and whether we do it at this meeting or not, I'm not sure, but uh, decide on the scope very soon and uh, put out a call for nominations. Which includes self nomination. The scope of the committee. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Having terms and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And what was helpful, real quick, was goals, which it would be probably in the scope and then that time frame, because that's what helps people know if they can be available and mm -hmm. committed. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, you look like you had some. I do have a question. Yes. Um, I, my question is about the actual LUC recommendation. Which, okay, Italy, that conversation got a little far afield and, and did have, I think, a couple of issues with it. But officially, what we're looking at is their recommendation was we hold a strategic planning facility to workshop to set goals. And what, <clears throat> excuse me, what I hear is doing instead is setting the goals. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I suppose we have to decide if we're comfortable with that. One option would be because I, I believe the protocol on this is if we do something different than what land use votes for, then we send it back to land use and say, hey, wait a minute, guys, how about this? And I, I do still see uh, a lot of benefit that we could have. Maybe we could kind of split it and say, what do you think about this? Let's get this going right now with these goals, and then let's meet as a community with this kind of workshop idea to talk about brainstorming basically because brainstorming is a little harder to fit within the community structure or also to, to community structure but also to involve the whole community is kind of perfect for that i think good segue so i i agree with the um i think what the this particular request coming out of earlier c was more of a um you know what do we what would be kind of a, a kickoff activity a capturing the community sentiment activity Around a uh, action plan implementation plan, so I think that still that still ties in with the with the uh, this general approach of splitting the task into sort of two sections, and uh, this sort of bigger community meeting would be part of the second section. It's not actually a GBOS committee, but uh, part of a housing action plan, which would kind of you know it can run roughly in parallel with the area plan, but it uh, it would complete after the area plan and would take in. You know, as a starting point, what's coming from the area. Um, I think the, the the question I have is how we fund that, um, and uh, I do take Kyle's uh, expertise very very seriously about. I think you said it was going to be a multi multi month activity to um, you know go through an RFP process, and um, you know even if we had a sole source contract, it's still a many many months to right. justify that and go through the whole process of getting money together. So you know maybe that's a, a four or five month activity. To get to a point where we could actually do that kickoff. If the community wants to do an LUC wants to do this sooner, then probably it's not, at least that initial part probably isn't a um, an activity that we could fund directly, but we could fund what follows that. 
and maybe we have a separate entity, maybe a nonprofit in the community, for example, um, fund that kind of initial meeting and kick off and then that information gets passed into the uh, the sort of real planning activity. Okay, so I have a proposition if that fits within the discussion that we we move ahead with this with the unless LUC uh, we move ahead with this committee idea unless LUC says halt to cease and desist basically um, but uh, and we can even maybe this time now, I'd like us to make progress on it. So I'd, I'd like us to see like what different roles we might want on the committee and let's let's make some suggestions. And then the other thing I'd like to, I'd like to toss back this um, community conversation idea to LUC with the idea that, you know, we've, we've managed this as town halls and we've managed this without RFPs and funding. And I don't, I don't know that we have to do it that way. Let's Let's put it, let's try a month putting it out to the community of like, hey, is there a way we can do this without making it complicated? Like maybe we can do it by next month if we do it like a town hall and we have the church and uh, like let's there might be a way we can move on this without having to get involved into quite the conversation about it. Or as as Mike mentioned, if a nonprofit is willing to pick it up and make it happen. I mean it's probably just a facilitation. We just need a somebody professional to somebody who could, could do it well and has the right subject matter expertise to kind of facilitate a discussion. That could be, I don't know, know that we're going to be able to fund that. I'll, I'll address that a little bit from the money side aspect of it, that was quite talked about at LUC in the sense that we use taxpayer dollars. It takes quite a process. We have to go through RFP process of selection. The way the purchasing restrictions are now through the assembly, it just adds on another month and a half to the process. So you're looking at three to four months before we even have somebody on board. Um, one thing that I you know from a staff perspective, when we do these type of RFPs, either through a nonprofit or through using the purchasing department of MOA, is a developed scope of work of what you, if you're going to hire a facilitator, you want to tell what that facilitator is going to do and what the end results are going to be, um, and you want them to produce that. And so I think there's a couple of steps that need to happen. One is that scope, what happens at this uh, town hall meeting is very clear as to what's going to be asked of and taken care of there. I think there was a feeling that bringing in somebody independent would help with this to help with planning. So that's why facilitator was mentioned um, in that aspect. And if there is a nonprofit entity, you know, Gerwood Inc. was expressing interest or, or um, you know, even the chamber maybe, um, they, they could definitely fund it. Um, but I think the scope still kind of has to be hammered out at the LUC level. Um, it wasn't clear coming out of that meeting as to what was the end result we wanted to facilitate or whatever this meeting was going to produce in that aspect. Uh, but then from there, we do get the results. Uh, we should have that power in hand. Um, and at that point, GBOS can, problem is you don't have a budget this year for 22 um, for that power, but you could move funds from undesignated funds and we could create something um, and make it work for the rest of the year. We did that with Cemetery. And um, and then in 23, excuse me, in 24, um, you'll be able to set a budget for that new power to, to continue on with the work. Thank you, Kyle. Jennifer. So my understanding correctly, we could maybe toss this back to LUC and say, can we get real specific on, on what exactly you want the end goal to be? But also, I personally would like a little more clarification. Of, like, are we absolutely sure this can be handled without spending government money on the town hall uh, structure that we've we used a couple times before in the last year, uh, depending on what those exact goal, end goals are? <coughs> With Dr. Yes. Well, we don't uh, to, oh, sorry. well, if you're finished and then yeah, you're not. Um, uh, I do understand your reluctance, I think, some for not putting forward what Land use committee specifically asked because we got in trouble for that. Um, and we took a clock about it. <laughs> but I don't want to, you know, I don't I don't think we're acting in bad faith by at least getting this going and trying to get a committee going and getting people working on it, talking about the game at all and talking about the short term and long term. So um, I would hate to see this go back to land use when I don't think we're going to get there. I, I think we're still pushing it forward. We just need to. Um, 
I mean, forming this thing is going to be a first step too, right? So, yeah. as one clarification, that's just something we can kind of bifurcate it. I think similar to what Michael's already saying. <laughs> I think if I got it right, sure. then yeah, let's do the committee and then let's talk about how to do the conversation. Let's get going and also get the, the community consensus, but maybe in a way that's quicker. Yeah. Right. And just to chime in, I know you were maybe going to say something, Mike. Uh, on this agenda item, part of it says formal subcommittee to address long term housing needs. So we would start that portion by maybe acting on something tonight about first steps of formal subcommittee and then the other portion address uh, at future meetings. Longer, longer term. Kyle? I suggest that maybe. You move on with that creation of that subcommittee, but also at the same time work on a scope of work that you take back to LUC to say, okay, we've gotten your message. Here's the scope of work we propose to you to address what your request is. Are you happy with that? And if they're happy with that, you move forward in that aspect. So I'm, I'm Mike, go okay. ahead. So I'm taking by uh, I'm going to follow up on the comment um, Jennifer made, and I because I agree as well. I think I think because of the situation we're in in terms of anything that's funded by GBOS. Um, if there's a if there's a desire for the for that com for the community discussion, I think that's going to take too long for us to fund it. But that community discussion has to go into something that's implementable, and that second part of the action, the action plan or implementation plan, I think that does fall within uh, government funding. So I, the way I would structure it is that we we probably focus on that planning thing as the long term scope, and that's maybe where we. Um, you know where we spend money, and then anything preceding that, we can we don't have, we'd have to swap into it. So it would be more of a, a thing that provides input into that planning activity, um, and then just throw that back to LUC. And if if there's some other funding source, um, I think you know if we do it as part of a as part of a plan, it's say four months down the road, and I think there's a desire to do it sooner than that. And if we do do it sooner than that, then it would have to have some other funding source. So. Yeah, you know, maybe that's a, a throw out to the community as a whole and see if anyone else is interested in doing that. Yeah, key ingredient. But we would focus, we would focus our scoping work on what follows that, um, and then almost by definition, that kind of can, you know, that gives you a sense of what has to come out of the community meeting. Thanks, Mike. Uh, any other comments from the board? Well, um, uh, the. Again, I think we, we've had a suggestion and maybe we should actually actually go a little bit further down the subcommittee path now. Yeah. Um, I feel comfortable starting. That's, I think now is a great time. Right. So I said, I think the scope should be to address two key questions. Uh, question number one is, how do we, you know, how do we work with, um, or from, you know, from a community side, from a, Representative local government side, uh, how do we work with mm -hmm. the activity which HLB is doing and reporting on? I believe on the twentieth next week uh, to the to the assembly committee um, for identifying land and um, and working with a local nonprofit, possibly partnering with another nonprofit to develop affordable housing. So that's question number one. And then question number two is: Are there any temporary changes we can make or recommend that could solve? Could provide temporary housing um, in the six to twelve month time scale to provide a, a partial solution until we get this HLV land and that developed into housing. Okay. This short term, you're talking through <coughs> um, changing some of the Regulations is that yeah. what is it? Yeah, I mean, so example, there, there's an example. I'm not saying it's the best example, but as an example, um, there was talk about um, it, this is actually related to um, some solutions to um, homelessness within Anchorage, but there was talk about using some temporary housing solutions there, and code just doesn't allow you to do it. Um, and we have exactly the same situation. It's, you know, code affects a lot of things we do to having to be more permanent housing solutions, which is fair. It's just we have this problem that we are not going to be able to provide that um, housing for at least two years. And we have the we have a problem today 
And it's, I think it's negligent for us to say that, you know, under the current structure, we can't do anything for two years, so we won't try. I think it's more appropriate to say, under the current structure, we can't do anything for two years, so let's try and change the current structure so there is a solution which we can implement sooner than that. Or we can provide a mechanism for others to implement. We're not necessarily going to do it to fund it, but uh, I think we you know, we need to do the outreach. Well, this committee needs to do the outreach and uh, and find out what other out ideas are out there and what other you know suggestions have come. For example, I've, I've heard this from uh, other business owners about um, you know a short term RV park or something like this. You know, on land they own, is that even feasible? These are the kinds of questions I think we should address right now. Jennifer, um, question for the chair. Yes, yeah. I think I heard that that Randy is is Randy Salt on. Yeah, but I heard that I thought not see him come in yet. But oh, he didn't come in yet. Okay. I'm I'm here. I'm here. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. We yeah. can hear you. Yes. Okay. Just uh, we skipped your uh, update a while ago, but now we're on number eight. I mean number nine. <laughs> So did you have a question for him? Jennifer? I did. I, I was interested if he had any feedback about the conversation we're having right now, and in particular in light of I some and heard some of your comments in connection to uh, temporary housing for, to combat the uh, folks on sheltered and Anchorage. And so I just wondered if you had anything to weigh in. Yeah, it, yeah. So I've I've talked to Pallet Shelter today and Dignity Moves. I'm going to visit Dignity Moves on Wednesday. Um, I'm kind of a, a hammer pounding a square peg at a round hole. So the general advice is for a temporary shelter, such as a pallet shelter, is basically the assembly would waive the, the code um, for a specific location for a specific period of time. Um, and that would let you to allow you to continue using shelters and move on to a more permanent housing solution. We're also at the CEDC posing the question to planning and zoning. What changes would we need to make to Title 21 and Title 23 to allow for this kind of sheltering? Again, it's sheltering opportunities. Um, you know, in my experience, with planning and zoning is is they'll tell you why they can't versus why they can. So I really want to push them into into that space of. I'm not asking how you can't do it. I'm asking what I need to do to make it happen. And if we can do that, we can also possibly look at shelter and opportunity code changes for Girdwood that would allow um, something like this. I, I know I sent maybe Mike and a few others um, a flyer on, a, I think it was an 88 person man camp that was for sale for a little less than $4 million. Um, again, we're gonna try the pallet shelter maybe. We're gonna try the dignity moves, which is similar to a pallet shelter possibly reco relocatables from ASD. So again, just trying to, my immediate concern is trying to stave off the the, the pending shelter or Sullivan disaster uh, coming the end of the month or in sometime in May. So hope that helps. Thank you. We have more questions. Just to, questions. Yeah, just yeah. to follow up on that, that we're, not, we're not talking about exactly the same thing. We're talking about the, the same problem. We have a different problem here, but, um, the same approach could help. There's a lot of things we can't do to the current code that if we if we frame them, excuse the pun, as a um, as a temporary solution for two years or three years and sunset it so it doesn't last any longer, that the objections to um, you know these solutions for there's a permanent there's a permanent um, solution go away. We just have this period where we cannot get what we need within two years. So we still have the problem within two years. So how do we address it now? And it may be there isn't a practical solution, but I think there needs to be a, a group of people looking at this series. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. I mean, you know, if the mayor would declare an emergency, we can we can cut a lot of red tape. There seems to be a reluctance to declare any kind of emergency. Um, but we certainly, I mean, the alternative in Anchorage is people living in the woods. The alternative in Girdwood is people dying living in cars. So it seems silly that if we have the resources available, why we can't connect that to the person and make it happen in these kind of situations. 
and especially on a temporary basis while we figure out the solution, the real solution and get temporary code changes. So that's I think that's probably our best our best path path is sort of an emergency action followed by what's going to take longer term changes to, to codes. Thank you, Randy, for your comment and for being here. Yep. Sorry I was late. I just I just I just got home late today. It's really OK. OK, thank you. Glad we noticed you're there. Uh, any other comments on the latest? Issues brought up Jennifer. Sorry, move along on this committee. Do you, uh, uh, the, the, um, if, if the chair is approved and the rest of the board feels up for this, I wonder if we can go ahead and kind of lay out what we might do with the committee and then go on. So, and, and I have a couple suggestions. Okay. Okay. I think that sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I was thinking, in particular, uh, I would like the committee similar to HHHAC to have a new name and also <laughs> to uh, to specifically to look for certain roles, not just self solicitation, but to look for certain roles. I appreciated about uh, that prior committee that uh, we specifically wanted a long term renter on there, and I. I'd like to see that again. I'd also like to see somebody specifically with um, some legal background and specifically somebody with some financial background so we can stay grounded in what's the and then lastly also somebody with some code background so we can stay grounded in, in what's possible legal and economically feasible. Thank you. Okay, we're all taking notes there and I think we by judging by the comments and nodding for the two short term goals, key questions of scope that Mike said we have in front of us or fresh on the mind from that part of the discussion. Anything else you want to talk about for subcommittee guy? Um, I know Lane, you said talked about it was it was brought up during our joint meeting plan use to um, I don't know. I don't know if we need to totally define these roles, but somebody possibly from Girdwood Inc. or Girdwood Land Trust, or you know, these people that have been, you know, um, working on this for a long time to be part of this process. I don't know if we want to say specifically, here's your groups, because we'll probably leave somebody out. But um, yes, thank you, Guy. That was definitely um, highly recommended at land use from the book. Yes, Mike. Yeah, I, I would advise against uh, slicing this too finely. Um, we're talking about you know five to seven people typically, and uh, yeah. we probably have we probably you know we probably have specified more than that in terms of number of requirements. So um, I would say that you know there's there's some two or three broad things that we would expect to be covered across the the breadth, and then you know, who's interested is the most who's interested in. You know, we we think it's suitable is the most important question. Who's prepared to put the work in? Mm -hmm. So I would have something which is less constricted, but these are all desirable traits, but are not not something we require. No, I get it. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's you build a committee, but you say you have to be on this committee to be on. It's the best way to build a committee, yeah. but. You know, it's fine. Those people do bring a lot to the table. Yeah, yeah, right. absolutely. Thank you. And guys. Elena, you said had mentioned it. So. Right. In that light, I would just add uh, by including members of the public to attend and participate, which has been going pretty well in the last two years, that those groups would be represented by being there, but so maybe not be committee. We don't know that right now. So I have two comments. Uh, Grace has her hand up and then one in the room. So Grace, if you have something, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, as Randy shared with you, um, emergency may be the, the language that needs to be put forward with respect to this committee. Um, honestly, it's a crisis in Girdwood. The housing, cri it is a housing crisis. <laughs> in a sector of our community that we have not had a chance to address. And I think as other communities in the United States have been dealing with this subject, um, dealing with their existing codes that generally specifically don't allow for uh, alternative housing approaches, 
um, I think it's very important that we recognize that this is a crisis in Girdwood. And with that being said, there's a lot of leeway when one addresses this problem saying it's a crisis. So uh, codes can be bypassed. There can be uh, other alternative solutions brought to the table that generally could not be brought to the table to deal with problems of this size at this moment. But because when you say it's a crisis, folks and with respect to the system that we have in place, make exceptions to the rule. And I really would suggest that we take a strong look at, at really renaming or addressing this subject matter as it's our crisis in Girdwood. It's maybe not a crisis in Anchorage. They have a completely different issue with respect to the homeless population. We have a homeless pop problem, but it is not dealing with homeless pop properties or problems or people that have other issues like we have. So um, that is one thing that I, I, I suggest very strongly when looking at this potential new committees or set of goals that you're talking about, because um, right now, um, other communities in the country are doing that and renaming it has been an important matter that has uh, moved the needle forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt in the room, if you could come closer. And thanks, Brian. Yeah, hi, uh, Matt Tractor. Just, just simply wanted to say, you know, in terms of, Mike, in terms of your thoughts on the short term, like the immediate try, I think that's, I think it's an excellent idea. Um, my thought on the committee is simply is, and you mentioned self-solicitation, and I think to Jen's point about making sure we have the right people, um, I'm all for democracy, but we need the right seven or nine people working as that group. That's That should be the top priorities to get those, get those people. Uh, whether it was a representative from Gordon Bank, it's who do we think has the best chance to move the ball forward financially, legally, politically, et cetera. The other thing I would say too is that, you know, we talked about kind of the town hall meeting or the kind of the community meeting, when the group kind of gets its ideas together for the short term and or kind of one to two year plan, that can then be brought to the community to throw stones at. So kind of the, the small group has all the expertise, but they're not gonna be perfect. They throw stones amongst themselves. Then they bring plans to the community for six and six month or one and two year plans and the community throws stones at it. So there's a lot of transparency, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's always gonna be democratic. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Brooks, go ahead online. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, speaking specifically to this uh, recommendation, um, my take on it is that it is not um, needed to uh, attempt to hold a formal strategic planning facilitated workshop to set goals for a formal subcommittee to address long term housing needs. To me, that sounds like a way to delay. Um, significant and serious discussion of a significant and serious problem. So, um, although I certainly respect, you know, what the LUC does, in my opinion, this recommendation should not be approved by the board because I think um, action is required that can be instituted um, much more quickly than what this recommendation would entail. Uh, secondly, just from a structural standpoint, in my view, um, rather than start with a workshop to set goals for a, sub, a, a formal subcommittee, you should establish a formal subcommittee and that subcommittee should hold meetings and people can discuss at that meeting, you know, what the goals should be, which frankly, it's a fairly simple concept to me. I mean, the goal is get more housing in Kirkwood. I mean, it's, so it's not the goal, it's how do you get that that is a more appropriate discussion. And I just think it's, we'll get there quicker if you start with the subcommittee rather than a formal strategic planning facilitated workshop. So to the extent there's a motion on the floor to approve the LUC recommendation, I would suggest you not approve it and explain to the LUC that the reason you didn't approve it is because you want to move more quickly. 
and that you think you can move more quickly if you establish the subcommittee first. Um, it was unclear to me from the discussion whether there actually is a motion on the floor and whether, um, you know, exactly how you would intend to deal with this pretty specific uh, recommendation from the LUC. I mean, it, it might not have a lot of details, but the basic recommendation is pretty easy to understand and act on. So that's the, oh, just one other thing. I really, really appreciate the engagement of uh, assembly member Solfi on this problem. I, I think we're very fortunate to have somebody that genuinely cares about it um, at his level, you know, at, at a, because as an elected official on the assembly, he is in a position to actually make things happen. You know, our job is more to just give people ideas, but he's uh, key to actually making something happen. So I'm really, really happy that he's engaged. Thanks. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, Brian in the room. Thank you. I appreciate it, Bri uh, Brianna. Um, so uh, to what uh, to what Brooks was talking about, and and the uh, the motion coming forward from land use committee was you know schedule and and source funding for facilitation of a community workshop, develop scope and goals of a committee to address the housing needs. I think that came fairly specific from land use committee. I wonder if um, someone from this group would be willing to go meet with uh, like Girdwood Inc. when they meet, I think next week maybe, see if they have some funding that they are going to be making available. And I wonder if we have a couple of groups within the community already starting to work independent of each other and if we can find a way to harness what is going on in the community right now into a, a more focused subcommittee, but that as Brooks brings out, needs to be the one that, that comes up with some of the goals and helps facilitate a conversation moving forward. But for finding um, uh, that, that, that money out there from private sources, rather than going through some funding that's gonna take a long time, we might be able to uh, uh, shake the tree a little bit and see if there's some groups out there that have something for us. Thank you, Brian. So I'm going to make a motion um, to. I'm not ignoring what you're saying, Brian. I'm just going to try and make a motion to deal with the other part. I think we're close to a decision. Um, so I'm going to risk risk something by suggesting workforce housing ad hoc workforce housing advisory committee, uh, which has an unfortunate acronym. But um, but uh, for one of a better term, um, let's form a. Uh, let's uh, create a committee now, uh, which has the two items of scope we identified earlier. OK, we can refine the scope before we actually appoint people, but I think we should um, we should lay out the general scope and you know, we're looking for, say, five to seven person committee. OK, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second to create a second. Jennifer, second. OK, now further discussion. Go ahead, board first. Um, so a couple of friendly amendments. It, it's popular. <laughs> when, yes, is it, when is it we let them name it? So we're, we're going to do a housing committee, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to WFHAC. And we learned last time that these yeah. things need to be done with care. So why don't we leave that? <laughs> well, we keep the veto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, OK, all right. So we will ask the yeah. committee to say, uh, this is a Girdwood housing focused committee of some kind. An ad hoc one with specific short term goals. Right, yeah. right. And then uh, I would, I, I, I might ask for um, seven to nine, um, and I would also like to ask that we include, uh, I now have a list of some of the things we're looking for, for preference on as we pick. And then lastly, I would also like it if we could include terms at this point, so we could throw out two years and see what the board. So those were a couple of amendments, but I think they were really two, three-ish. Okay, so let's start, well, we could start with the naming one. And yeah, I've, I've, we're going to take that as a friendly. Okay, so that, so with that. Okay, second one was um, including the list of things we're looking for is as part of this committee formation. Okay. And then third one was uh, including terms of some kind. Okay, I also heard the number 
Oh, the numbers, which yeah. it shares the number seven, but the more people, the more complicated schedules get. So I feel like eight, nine could be a person that's not always there requiring attendance. Five to seven is easier. Let's say, let's say seven. Let, uh, what I do is propose if the second is okay. Let's say seven people, but uh, if we get more, we could expand. But the intent is so. Let's go. That's what we did. That's how it worked Okay. Does that follow for people that are listening? <laughs> and I have a question or a comment. Okay. Uh, and then the terms before that guy, uh, the terms would be up to for discussion. And initially, this the suggestion was a six to twelve month time scale for action goals. I mean, don't want to confuse action with the long term plan, but um, the goals. So it could start with 12 months. Just so we finally have, have a, a window. I was hoping for something definite. I don't care. At least 12. I would say a uh, guy. Um, yeah, so just on the scope. Um, you know, I, I think Bruce mentioned it too. I mean, there's going to be a lot of smart people that get together. So this scope is just a guiding point of starting off point. Mm -hmm. And right now it's the two key points that um, Mike brought up that we were adding to, but they would be um, more fine tuned after the meeting or, or expanded. Extrapolated. Anything else on those? I'll, before we take uh, a hand out there online, could we? Wait. Yes. One more. So did we set a term? Uh, uh, 12. Was, I suggested 12 months. Okay. Just to so start. So friendly amendment, so 12 months. Uh, it's not a committee to last for 12 months. Yeah, I feel like that'd be like the starting point. Yeah. Maybe continue and then. Uh, there are substitutes for other people to step into that place. Great. Um, is the body comfortable with voting on these amendments? Um, I'm not clear what the uh, set of criteria are with the people, mm -hmm. what is listed. So oh, right. we haven't covered that amendment right. yet. So, so, let's keep that so far, so good. So yeah. far, so good. I think that's the question. So far, so good. Okay, so far, so good. Uh, we want to go over that next or vote on one the amendments without the specific list. We have we, the, the motion we just we've just kind of accepted those amendments. So now what we have is a motion which is um, we're going to create a an ad hoc committee for twelve months term uh, to be named um, with seven members looking at the two items we discussed earlier. Uh, Short term, short term approaches to allow temporary housing within the you know two year, one to two year uh, time scale, and um, to help with the um, the HLB and the ident HLB identifying land, which can be passed off to a um, local non profit for development into affordable lands. So they are the two topics they're looking at. Um, we have seven members named to be determined. What we haven't done yet is identified what um, particular list of, uh, of requirements we're looking for, a list of things we're looking for. We can do that next if we're all going by assent on these amendments. Is that OK? Well, right. we're, we're about to change the motion. So the motion now includes those. Right. OK. Motion now includes those. And let's move to those specific items then. So to, to be clear, it's, it's it's not like everybody has to have a label mm -hmm. or that there's set roles, but I, I think it would be fair to say that in, in particular, we're looking for attributes that include legal, financial, code, uh, long term renter, local nonprofit, builder, real estate, resort development, or community need experience. I'll sound great, Jennifer. And um, experience recommended, but not exactly. essential. Exactly. Well, applicants. Exactly. Yes, Mike. Sorry, just, what, could you repeat the list? I got to the non profit. Sorry. Legal, financial, 
yep. toad, yep. long-term renter, yep. local nonprofit, builder, real estate, resort development, community needs. Okay. You say community needs was the last one. Community okay. needs. Needs, okay. Okay. Any further discussion on those attributes? Uh, just one question, and Mike brought it up, and I agree. Um, they need, to, I don't know how much time they're going to have to spend on this each month, but if we're going to have to consider or let those people, we need to think about that if they have time to commit to it. Could, right. They might come up with that, I would think, but that is a really obvious we question. We should consider it yes. if we're picking so. And use of the room and staff and all of that. It's not just presumed. Uh, we have one, we, we should keep going, but we do have one hand online or should we just finalize this amendment? Yeah, I'd say that's, uh, we have this amendment of the list of, um, the list of, the, the, the list of attributes we would like across the point. Mm -hmm. That's for us to, you know, so I guess in the solicitation we're saying, you know, make it, Make it known if you fall into any of these categories. Yep, that sounds very beneficial. Okay, anything else? All right. Could we then, I'll, uh, Ryan Hutchins, thanks for being so patient. Kabibi, could you go ahead? Hi, thank you. Um, so I was the one who put forth the LUC motion that passed unanimously in the last land use committee. Um, so I think I can maybe add some clarity to what we were requesting. Um, there was a, there was a feeling it seemed amongst the members that there's a number of organizations within the community that are already doing a lot of work with this um, that people not affiliated with those organizations may not be aware of. And so providing a workshop to the community that was open to everybody, but allowed those organizations to also present their work, we thought would help better educate the community on what is already being done, uh, what challenges we face and what opportunities there are as well. We specifically asked GBOS to fund this or to not, pardon me, not to fund it, but to source funding based on staff's recommendation that government funding would be uh, time consuming and, and more of a challenge. Um, so I get like, I hear you all moving forward with creating the committee. Um, there was consensus among the, the folks at the land use committee that getting the community together to talk about what our needs were and who the community thinks should be on this committee and what the goals should be was very important. Um, the members of the land use committee also felt strongly that there should be a professional facilitator during that period um, and that it should not be facilitated by a member of the community. Um, so hopefully that information is helpful as you all continue this discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for speaking up. Uh, and any other comments from the board on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Ryan says. The, I think what, what he's what talking about is slightly different from what we're what we are talking about in terms of the specific subcommittee with a specific set of short-term goals. I think that's very that's really more focused on the um, the longer term, longer medium term activity that we have decided we can't fund immediately. Okay. Um, I didn't get that for a minute. Maybe you could come back on and clarify that. Um, it sounded like he wanted that process to be part of developing what we are about this committee and defining this committee. And if that's, if he made the motion, if that's what they're saying, and that's what Lynn, he's put us to ask us to do, 
then we should consider what we're doing because we've done this before. Yeah, I think it's sort of slowed things down. So, mm -hmm. I, Ryan, did you? Can I, can I just sort of go ahead. Just quickly address? Right. Mm -hmm. I think there's a there's a distinction between things we do within our service area powers, uh, which mm -hmm. we unilaterally should be doing, and things where we're um, we, we're using land use as a as you know effectively the community council type role, the community council advisory role. What we're talking about in terms of this subcommittee is things that are within our powers or will be as of October the 25th, but it's certified. So um, it's not land use's job to tell us how to do that. It's not land use's job to tell us how to do um, how to do uh, public safety and other things that within that we welcome it. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's not. It's a different situation from things which are, um, you know, a pure community council thing and outside the service area role. So this is the separation between the, the service area responsibility, which is um, which I would say is these the, the shorter term things that we want to try and move on quickly now, and the longer term things, which maybe the service area can help fund, but is more of a community activity. So there's a, there is a distinction between these two things. Right. We did meet with the land use committee, yes. the joint committee, yeah. asking him to do just this. Right. right? Yeah, that's right. And, that's then, and then they made that. a recommendation. Yes. Yeah. 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 But I'm just, you know, we've seen it before, and I don't, if it's completely not what they're looking for, they're probably not stopped. But. Right. Okay. Ryan, do you have any follow up? Just in case. Um, I mean, I, th I think it, it would be accurate to say that we were not asking Gibos to form a subcommittee immediately um yeah i think i think that that is an accurate statement um you know i don't think that anything we sent to you necessarily um prohibits that or well obviously doesn't prohibit it but like discourages it um but from the community discussion in that meeting um my sense was and the way i tried to word the motion was so that the community could gather and discuss what needs were and i understand that that may be a slower process i guess i just want to make sure that um there's understanding on on what land use was uh requesting Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Karen, do you have something? I'm, I'm just listening to the conversation, and especially after uh, the gentleman that was at Land News kind of clarified uh, what their intent was. Um, it's always been my understanding for as long as I've been in Gerber that the Land Use Committee is really the body that should make all decisions having to do with land use. And GBOS is Goal is to simply pass on that information. So if there's a question, if you don't think the land use made the right decision, the most appropriate thing to do is kick it back to them, not tell them what to do. You just kick it back and say, for whatever reason, we don't think you did it right, go do it again. It is, I do not believe it's the Chibasa's purview to actually develop land use strategies or, or plans or even subcommittees that's managed. thank you any other comments from the board uh jennifer yeah i um actually we do have a protocol for this i mean i don't have my manual with me but uh we do have a protocol for this i think we can we can say hey here's here's our suggestion this committee let's get moving forward with this right now but um also we certainly can take this other idea one of the things that i noticed in the land use discussion that didn't really come up is some of the practicalities like for example the fact that the their idea about funding is really going to make this take so much longer like if we accept the idea that we are in crisis can we really wait however long the funding business takes to then have the facilitated conversation to then do this to then do that can we really wait that long 
under crisis. So I think uh, I would like to still address this motion, pass it if we want to pass it, and then say, all right, land use, this is what we think. Here's our suggestion for this committee. Uh, we aren't, there is still lots of room to, to talk about what can we do right now. That whole conversation, that is a community conversation too, that this committee can, can guide and form. And same thing with the, the longer range plan. Uh, we are in a kind of a tricky place, and Mike, you're pretty good at this. I think we are in kind of a tricky place where we're about to take over housing as a power under land, or sorry, under GBOS. So it's 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 this is going to start working a little bit differently than I think traditionally it has. Like we will be responsible for as soon as funds are involved, GBOS is the entity. Am I correct on that, Mike? If it's, yeah, if it's uh, zero funds. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer, for your thoughts on that too, and all the discussion. Are there any other questions from the board or comments on the motion, the amendments? Uh, I think in, in lieu of time and on this item, we're almost to an hour, so we could vote on that right now with the motion. I think, Ryan, your hand might be up from before and the other speakers spoken a few times, if if it's really quick. Uh, and if the body's okay, I could take the other hand. Can we just uh, extend this by 10 minutes? Yes. We extend took out the motion. Seven, I, I to nine by 10 minutes. Do I have a second? Yeah. Okay, second. Any objection? Okay, thank you. We'll extend this 10 more minutes. Grace, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you, Brianna. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I think we need to consider while we're talking about this committee and and this this goes to the makeup of the committee. Um, I personally uh, over the last year and a half, I think we I've come to the conclusion that we have a crisis in housing uh, in excess of over a hundred person need in our community, um, and I'm talking about a hundred workforce housing. Uh, deficiency, if not more than maybe even 200 um, uh, people in Girdwood today that are suffering from lack of, of, of quality and safe housing. And if we're going to be talking about this issue of providing a subcommittee that is going to address this issue, I think we should address, you know, like I said, the elephant in the room, which is, you know, anywhere from 100 to 200 people of need. With that being said, we really do need to structure the committee with individuals that understand the economic impact that that has. So when you're talking about a development, um, which is not unusual in most communities, in Girdwood it will be a first, um, we are talking about a development a team or a developer, a builder that has experience dealing with 100 units. That means a project level of somewhere between 30 to $50 million. That is not the Girdwood environment that we're talking about today. So when we're talking about a makeup of committee members, I really encourage you to be talking about an architect, uh, civil people, um, a builder, um, lender, and the folks that really understand what it means to do a hundred, I mean, a 30 to $50 million project, because that is what we're talking about. We have experience in our commuter community of the greater Anchorage area, but certainly we do not have that experience in Girdwood Valley today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Okay, are we ready to vote on this? I'll take that. Can, actually, can I make just one? Please make one more. Um, since we got 10 extra minutes, um, mm -hmm. we left. Um, so the land use recommendation was to hold a formal strategic planning facilitating thing. I mean, what this reads here, and I don't agree with it 100% because I think it does, I think forming a committee is like the first step, and I was worried about that during the land use committee. But what they're recommending um, is definitely not what we're doing, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it's just, it is a recommendation. Okay. And not, and this item has been discussed by our body before, and so from the subcommittee was not, I don't think, far-fetched from something we were doing next a few months ago. 
to address its urgent need. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, so actually, I don't see anything here that prevents that just per se. If it, if they wanted the facilitated workshop to set the goals. We're saying, okay, what about these potential goals for now just to get started? And then I don't think that precludes doing this, but yes, it is different than exactly what came through. I think we pass what we want to pass and send it down to them and say, hey, what do you think? And I think this is the most efficient way to go forward is what we're talking about, but right. it's not what they're asking for. Right. Right. And he had to take a lot of conversation and put it into one sentence. Yes. It's pretty difficult to do, I think, so, to encompass it all. Uh, I'll ask for a roll call vote, Kyle. Okay. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Deborah Wingard? Yes. Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Okay. Now, the motion was the amendment. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, so, everyone, for all of your comments and discussion. Mike. So, yeah, so just, just going back to um, what we have done is not. Exactly what MUC recommended. We've done something that's been asked. It's not at all. Um, right. And so, because they're talking about long term housing needs and we're focusing more on short term issues. Um, so, I think still the question is is there any formal action we want to take on um, the longer term you know, planning activity and um, you know, this, this request about a facilitated workshop or town hall? And I'm, I mean, I think what I've heard so far is we're not in a position to, be, because of the issues around the municipality functional, functioning at the moment, we're not in a position to do anything in the short term, to fund anything in the short term. So what our, our role would be is to ask somebody else to do it. In effect, um, encourage it, but to ask somebody else to, to fund it. On the longer term implementation or action plan, that's something we could start now, um, or we can wait until we formally have the power um, you know, in, in, in a week's time. I'm going to, what I'm going to suggest is we, we, um, we basically decline <laughs> to, we decline to fund um, anything for, uh, you know, this, this strategic plan, a formal strategic planning facilitated workshop, because we simply don't think we can do so in the, in the timescale necessary. Um, but we, we uh, we had an item on our next agenda to um, to look at a you know to start a process of putting together an RFP and scope for an action plan or implementation plan or something of those lines, and then you know we can definitely recommend or suggest that somebody else within the community may may be in a better position to fund this facilitated workshop um, with the intention of that feeding into this long term plan. So I guess the very specific thing is we would do, we we basically are not in a position to fund this thing in the short term, um, but we could we can discuss our next meeting funding a you know, a, a long term housing plan or an implementation plan. That's what I would say. Okay. So there's the motion. So the motion is that you know we we basically put that back to land use and say we don't think we can do this in the short term. We don't think we can fund this in the short term. Um, but we do, we are going to, in our next meeting, discuss um, what a long term action plan would look like and how to fund that. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, for further discussion, I would just add for obvious clarifying reasons that Prop 7 will be certified at the end of this month. We won't have a meeting until next month, too to discuss this item further. So, uh, any other thoughts about it for now? Ryan, is your hand still up from earlier? Did you have a it's up again, sorry. No, no apologies needed, I'm just checking. So go ahead, the board doesn't have anything at the moment. Um, so the way that we, the way that I worded this motion and request was specifically that GBOS source funding, not that GBOS funds 
the workshop. Um, again, based on recommendations from staff, land use felt that it would be uh, slow and arduous to get work through funding um, governmentally. And so our hope was that GBOS could facilitate conversations with nonprofits or other organizations within Girdwood that may have funding um, and ask them for their assistance to fund a community workshop. So it sounds like there may be some misunderstanding about that. We are not requesting that GBOS fund the workshop. I understand that that is outside of GBOS's power until the election is certified and we figure out what we're doing with Prop 7. Um, but our request was that GBOS source the funding um, we were hoping from an external entity. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So let's modify the. Okay. Let's modify the motion to uh, to say that we will uh, we will we will ask nicely. We will seek some seek some funding from elsewhere. Was the second sure that I'm amending to that? Oh, okay, and after that, agreeing to the amendment, I was just going to remind us that if. Girdwood Inc. has a meeting next week and someone could go, we could go to not make anything formal. I don't know how his body feels about that, but it would be before our next meeting, but it would just be for information maybe. Uh, Margaret. I could use a restatement of the current motion. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> We're not in a position, so what we will do is GBS will encourage or encourage other entities to fund a facilitated workshop. Um, you know, we do not believe we are in a position to do so in the time scale needed. Um, and then additionally, at our next meeting, we will have an, we will discuss um, the scope of and potential funding of a, a longer term housing implementation plan. So I don't know if that's really a motion, that's kind of an agenda item. Yeah. As an observer, I think the thing that is somewhat problematic in this request of LUC and perhaps why I didn't register it and record it properly in this agenda is that the GBOS doesn't have the power to request other people spend their money on something like this. So, you know, it. I don't think that it's reasonable for the GBOS to be trying to facilitate something that is outside completely of their powers. Your powers are very defined, plus one coming, which is complicated enough. But um, as far as going to other entities and asking for them to fund a quasi-government function, which will be a government function here shortly, gets really confusing. And what I heard at the land use meeting did get confused having to do with, well, if they're paying for it, then they get to determine the scope of work and who the facilitator is. And it, it just gets really complicated in a hurry. And so I just wanted to offer that this has been kind of uh, a difficult topic from the get go. And it was a good solution that they came up with in order to wrap it up and move it forward. But I can see why you're in the situation that you're in right now. Too. I'd like to withdraw my motion and uh, hopefully my second will agree. Oh, was something different. <laughs> okay, we see nodding and the motion is withdrawn. So instead of the original motion, what I'm going to propose is that uh, <laughs> we we move forward and discuss our next meeting um, a 
housing implementation plan and housing action plan um, and how we will scope that and fund it. Um, and in the meantime, uh, what we will do is make it clear to any other interested parties uh, that we're intending to, we're going to be discussing that in the future and it will, we, will not be, um, we will not be able to um, provide funding and uh, for this particular facilitated workshop in Tracer. Um, Okay. Guy, you'll second? I'll second it then for now. Yeah. After you second it, we can have a discussion. Okay. It's seconded by Guy. Discussion? I think I, I think I don't have to begin. Is this just a reply back to land use? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. So we're at least communicating. Yeah, we're people. communicating. They're asking us to do something we don't think we can do. Okay. Oh, Jennifer. I don't necessarily disagree. I understand the basics of we need to respond, but it does seem kind of general. I'm not really sure we're getting where we're going to get with long term planning next week. I mean, at our next meeting, like it seems like kind of big ass for what we're going to be discussing in the next meeting, but let's let's try it. I mean, I'm open to trying it, but I can, I can still see some pitfalls. Hmm. You're kind of punting a bit as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and just to add, okay. it is long term, so it doesn't have to be absolutely finished at the next meeting, but the yeah, sure. conversation continues. Um, I just say one thing. So yes. Yeah, I mean, that's, we've done two things. And I think what we've, what we've effectively done is separate out the short of the things we need to act on immediately with things we do not need to act on immediately, but still have to be treated with some urgency. By, by pulling out things we have to act on immediately and starting to act on those. Cool. Uh, and we did go four minutes over, 10 minutes. Can we'll I give a just a five minute extension then so we can just vote? Yeah, let's, let's five minute extension to vote. Do we have a second? Sorry. Thanks, Jennifer. I'll go by assent. No objections. Okay. Any other comments on this? Yeah, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Sure. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Woodgard? Yes. Uh, Amanda Sassy? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Margaret. Also, number 10, Redwood Industrial Park concerns, our planning, and others. So I uh, send an email requesting a, um, a meeting get set up in the future between the um, industrial park, our studios, in the, uh, HLB and industrial park um, tenants, uh, permit holders and uh, leaseholders and potentially owners. I'm not sure if anyone's actually got on hand yet. Um, I haven't had anything back. Uh, this we'll have this night and next uh, Monday. Monday, great. I have a Kyle. thing to talk with the board about on this issue. Um, we need to move forward with power, and um, and so I'm pursuing that. And so tonight, I'd like to introduce to the board a proposition uh, or a proposal from uh, the Pate Company to do electrical design for us. Uh, in order for us to get a transform, transform it a lot, we have to have a site plan of what electrical improvements we're going to initially do there. And um, what we're looking at tonight is uh, a day company would bring on an electrical engineer um, that would lay out our plan for uh, what the power is going to be like there so that you gash uh, um, those will be connecting to their service um, once they install it. Um, the board has already approved uh, close to $18,000 for a gash to bring in um, the electrical transformer to the lot. Uh, but in order to get to that step, we need to complete this phase. And basically, we would come up with electrical design documents and permitting um, to have this uh, electrical system put in. Uh, the engineer would provide us an estimate on what the cost will be for that. So the first step here would be just the design phase. Um, and then you would get an engineer estimate, and that would tell us how much it's going to cost to actually put the electrical boxes on the property um, and get that going. Um, and we would work uh, over the next two to four months to get this done so that we can hopefully um, uh, and really pushing for the two month phase so that we can maybe possibly do construction this year to get that electrical line in. And I'll just give you a reference here so you can see what we're proposing. And it may be hard to see uh, from where you are. I'm sorry, I just got this today, so I wasn't able to put it in the packet tonight. Um, but uh, this would be uh, 
So when you come into the industrial lot, this is the AMU plant off to the uh, right of the picture, and then the five uh, now privately, at least four and five privately owned lots in the industrial park. And then you come down, and, and this is the road maintenance lot. Uh, which became very small when this huge cul-de-sac came in. Um, but what we'd like to do is bring power to the upper corner where we have a fence line with AWU. Um, and then we have over an existing bowl rail here where we park our equipment in the summer. Um, in the winter, we have to put our equipment over here in a temporary spot and it's very closed and condensed. Um, and we want to get back to where we should be operating out of. And on that bowl rail, we would put uh, these little uh, red things indicate um, outlets that we put in. And it'd be 120 and 220 outlets for welding and things like that. Um, it's industrial power that we could put there for, for those type of maintenance. And then also lights. So we have some lights in the mornings uh, when we're out there at two or three in the morning trying to get things going in January. So um, so basically overall they get to a design that shows this and then Chugash would put in their large transformer over here in the corner. Um, uh, we have a budget right now, 7180. So basically we're we're asking the board um, to um, uh, allow me to use the approved funding for $7,200 to complete this design so we can get you guys to put that transformer in for us and then hopefully go right in and put those power outlets in so the next winter we're operating off that lot, not, not on the HLP lot. So all new information, if you want, we can hold on up a month on this or maybe uh, move our one of our meetings to a special meeting and try to address it at that point. We're just working through this mm -hmm. now. Mike. Media question. Does this help anybody else at the industrial plant? the same. Or is it thing. just us? Just us. What it does do is it opens up a temporary um, power source. Bob, Bob Wolf could take that over. He could park his equipment there. He could plug in. He could bring it on all his own infrastructure and use that temporary power source and, and do that. Um, he's the only other operator on that side of the park that works in the winter. Um, yeah, there are new leaseholders in there, but they're not like snow removal operations. Um, and all the other five developed lots now, they have all the power at hand. They just haven't tapped into it. Um, and they have gas there too and telecommunication. So um, when they were building out the new road there, we requested the power to be brought to a lot, but HLB didn't have the funding to provide it, so it didn't happen. So we're trying to uh, fix that problem. And just for clarification, this, <clears throat> this is just a temporary solution. This isn't going to, this isn't going to get us any closer to a permanent solution, even if the magic wand was waived. And this power would be a permanent location. Okay. It is put in and, oh, you know, our awesome. long-term goal is to stay in that right. facility area. Um, but the boundaries would hopefully change when they go to realign everything so that we have a better working space for us and the fire department in that location. Can I suggest we um, we table this item now, but discuss it at the end of the manager meeting next week? Okay. And I think this would be a good signal. Okay. This is exactly the sort of problem we're facing. Yes. We can add that to the end of the agenda as a business item for GBOs to consider. Thank you, Kyle. Great news. Yeah. I was going to ask if we would talk about it at the budget meeting, but this yeah. is a better yes. relation, I think. Guy? I was going to mention the budget meeting okay. too. I mean, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, I think it's good Anything here. Anything else from the board? Thank you. So, uh, 11, discuss and update Girdwood Capital Projects. Uh, I would like to put that on hold. Uh, honestly, I haven't had enough time to sit on that, but I'm working on end of year reporting. And then I think we could discuss that as part of um, the budget meeting. Uh, at that point in time, and if we need to do anything with a motion, we could push it to your next month meeting. Okay. Priority. Uh, any questions or comments from the board on that? Thanks, Kyle. Uh, number 12, finalize agenda topics for the MOHBUS quarterly meeting next Monday, for 24. Margaret, would you like to come us off? Well, I'm wondering if you would rather postpone this discussion until the end of old business. Mm -hmm. And then we will have had some other conversations instead of revisiting. Revisiting. OK. I would move number 12 to 18, basically. OK, yeah, we'll put that as a motion, definitely. Um, we'll move number 12 to the end of um, old business. Thank
Thank you for the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Move the order of the day. Thank you, Guy. Any further discussion or any discussion? Okay. And hearing no objections, I'll go by assent and 12 is down there so that Karen Sitzaro can talk to us. Number 13, Girded Forest Fair 2023. Welcome and thank you for patient. Hi. Um, Aaron Scaro, current secretary of the Goodwood Forest Fair. Um, I came and talked to you last month a little bit. Um, our site plan is not expecting to change a great deal from um, last year. We had a pretty successful fair last year. Um, so I was going to give you an update where things were and maybe talk to you about the waiver and then see if you had any questions. Um, and then my expectation of Kyle's in agreement is maybe we'd go for that formal vote next month when I've got more stuff finally. Okay, so I'm just going to run down kind of a list. Most of the stuff is submitted with a few things outstanding. Like, for example, everybody wants to see the insurance and sometimes it's just slow to get that final certificate from them. But we have the same company we've had for years. They're charging us about the same amount of money. So that one we're not nervous about. But um, we have applied for the Norris permit. Uh, Tommy Salami is helping me out with the HLB permit and has that underway. Um, we're working to, to develop a little bit better camping map this year. It's one of the things when we talk with the fire chief um, to kind of have a map that kind of shows where people are parking and we kind of have better exit ways and they're going to lay down some hose back there, some fire hose. It's not going to be live with water in it, but if something happened, they could just go hook up right away um, and some better identification signs like you're in the moose campground so they know where they are if something goes wrong um our alcohol permit we usually wait until we have more pieces ready but we are gathering the taps cars getting people age discrimination people signed up stuff like that we're getting organized but we haven't actually submitted for that alcohol permit uh, i talked about insurance and uh, that includes the additional insurance including the diamond i think we've got the diamond mall plus a lot again the whole that bus last year was that was the perfect location. I talked about that last time, but we're we're even considering um, we're still considering trying to put on even an extra bus on Saturday, so we would have even a quicker uh, turnaround. But bus all three days, and that is actually live on the website. If you haven't gone to the website yet, go ahead and check it out because uh, you can sign up for all your volunteer positions. You can sign up for camping. You can get your bus tickets. You can get your friends your bus tickets. Um, so check it out. They've done a good job making it more user friendly on the on the phones too. Um, I'm gonna skip that one because I'm gonna talk to you about it in a minute. Uh, special event permit request. There's lots of special permits. You may not know this, but there are like three or four things that are called special permits. And apparently last year I lost one, but this year I think I've applied for all the special permits. Sent one off today, uh, and I think the traffic people will also be happy, not just. The other special people. Rent a can are on board and they're going to give us the same price as last year. Love the potty people. Security people, same thing. They're coming back. They're not going to charge us more. Um, inflation doesn't happen to the force fair, at least not again this <laughs> year. Um, uh, profit and loss statement. I will have that updated with uh, um, uh, the final application. It's basically, it costs a lot of money to run the fair and uh, we spend a lot of money. We make a lot of money and we give back. Luckily, in the last couple of years, this year is over $40,000 back to all the community organizations. And I think one year before we had a little bit higher, $50,000. So we're really happy to be able to give away that money. And even though there's a lot going in and a lot going out, the fact that the balance gets to come back into the community is great. Um, working on the fire permit, uh, fire marshal permits uh, with that's an AFD thing as well as working with the Girdwood Fire thing and the parade. Uh, good news, I am talking with the two, basically the two people that exist as far as entities for traffic. They um, they are both talking to me and willing to give me quotes. So I'm confident that we may have to spend more money, but we will have traffic people. And, um, and they're both, you know, versed in how to manage the parade. So parade will be the same, same time, 10 o'clock. Tell your friends to get here early. Um, and the towing contract, we're hoping that we'll have the same sort of relationship with the cheap or the service area where we'll share the cost of the truck sitting down here the whole time, and then we each pay our own towing. 
Um, and the community appreciation was last week and it was really great to see. We had a lot of people, some great new people showing up to volunteer for different shifts and um, had a good time. Um, and so then back to the one thing I was going to, first of all, let's see if there's any questions about anything I talked about last time or this time, just general updates. Okay, so the thing I was going to ask you about tonight to consider, and I don't know whether you can vote on it, but maybe be ready to vote on it next year or next uh, month, is just the uh, fee waiver. Every year we ask for the fee waiver. Like sometime in 2016, Tommy O'Malley convinced whoever was on the board at the time to sign it in perpetuity. But we do like to bring it to your attention every year that we are asking for the typical um, parks and rec park fees to be waived for four square because we do quite a bit of work in the fair, kind of sprucing up the park, and the whole event is for the Gurdon community to try to keep that. So um, I also want to say that while it's a lot of fun and a lot of people enjoy Forest Fair, you know, from other places in here, it's also a really key part. Having a big festival is a key part of being a Four Season Resort, and it's something that Gurdon was known for, even if you're a business owner and you don't particularly like get a bump in your business on Forest Fair weekend. It is a value to our community to be known with such kind of a fun family oriented event. Um, it still kind of has that kind of happy hippie vibe. Um, it's, I think there is value in that. So hopefully you'll consider that when you look at our fee waiver request. Thank you, Karen. Uh, any questions first for Karen, even though she just asked you any questions? Mike. John, so you, I think you said it um, Tommy asked the people on the board in 2016, whoever it was. Tommy was one of those, so it was probably was asking himself. <laughs> do we? I was going to ask a clarification. Do we? I think we did. Um, I think we did a multi-year fee waiver recently. It is. I think it's not really. I don't think you have to pass the motion to pass the waiver. We just always want to make sure that the current board is aware that there is a resolution out there writing that waives the fees for for it. I just to chime in, I feel like I heard that last year, and I don't recall doing anything except acknowledging it. But I would entertain a motion if anyone would to like to. It would be more of a, a gesture. And if we hear nothing, then we just go with what's written in that resolution. But you know, the makeup of the board changes, so we always want to make sure that people are aware. I got one question for you. are the the nonprofits that you donate to. Are they on the website? You know, I don't know if, the, if they put the whole list on the website now. Um, I had that elevator speech. I don't know if we're doing it like beyond that, but I, I mean, I can you know, we hit a couple highlights. I just thought it was really cool because there's a bunch of good programs. Yeah, it, I mean, it hits the public knew that. That might. I don't know if you could. I don't know for sure yet. I haven't like searched for it if she actually. Uh, I, I just thought that I mentioned somebody. They were yeah. surprised, and it was friendly too. So I think. Cool. Thanks for asking. I'll let her know if you asked. Uh, just, uh, I will take the motion then. So, uh, we'll just uh, do a motion to acknowledge that uh, there is a fee waiver and we support that fee waiver. Thank you, Mike. Do we have a second for that motion? Full second. Jen, start. Any objections? Okay. We'll buy a on that. So, we honor that resolution. Thank you. Kyle, did you have anything? But just one thing, Karen, I just thought of it because you're here. Uh, somebody did call me and they said they're trying to sign up for volunteer shifts, but then they go back and they don't see their name on the website. You know, I saw that going on too. Yeah. I, just, I mean, I didn't see it. I just saw people texting about it. So I don't know what the heck's going on. Yeah. So I just pass along. I know you got some okay. people on it. Thank you. <laughs> you know what? I was going to remind you. I know we talked about it, but just that the campground host is going to be. Yes, we've okay. already discussed it. We got a spot for them. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great work. Thank you. A lot of work. So about the week. Uh, new being to number. Well, oh. Okay, 14 request to renew resolution of support for no parking permits. And this is with packet. The Timberline, Virgin Creek Falls Trailhead. So this is kind of uh, we like for you to renew this. Um, uh, motion that was passed in 21. Um, this has fallen off uh, traffic's radar. I think they focused on um, doing the improvements for like Loveland and those no, those uh, stop signs. But um, you know, that problem still persists up there. We have temporary signs and they disappear in the winter. 
and we'd like to get permit signs put in by uh, traffic. So we're hoping that you will new, renew this so we have a new uh, resolution that we can take to the new traffic director and then hopefully uh, move this along and get those signs placed up there at the top of the cul-de-sac. What's the will of the body? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. that we, um, we rewrite this resolution reflecting that there was a previous resolution and, and uh, this is the continuation. Thank you for the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Jennifer, second. Any discussion? Is this something you could do as staff? Just basically take this. We can rewrite it and then get it to rewrite it. So, yep. And we'll put in the point that the 2021 uh, resolution was enacted upon. Thank you. Thank you for working on that. Thank you. Come to fruition. Uh, any objections? Let's do roll call, Kyle. Just sure. Uh, Brianna Sullivan? Yes. Mike Edgington? Yes. Guy Wade? Yes. Jennifer Woodgard? Amanda Seth? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Agenda item 15, LUC 2404 05, Alliance Green Short, Short Plot Action Input, requested by May 5th or, or May 15th director decision. Yeah, so this is a um, uh, short plot. So this is a basically a request from Alaska to subdivide or to divide a piece of attractive land they have into two parts. Um, the title in the map on the plan itself says, I think, employee housing. Yep, correct. <clears throat> so we infer that's what it's for. Um, and I think that maps some of the things that matches some of the things that um, the 12 employees. Um, there's concern. I've heard concern in the community about how this will affect parking. I've heard concern in the community about how it affects um, whether that's actually a, is or isn't a safe place to uh, put residential housing. Um, it has, at least it's, it's made me think about where um, the avalanche hazard maps come from. Um, I think the hazard avalanche map that the Muni has is quite a few years old, and we know that precipitation is different and you know, other things have changed. So I, I don't know whether that's an accurate or inaccurate um, sort of determination of what's high hazard and what's moderate hazard. I just don't know. But I think that's an interesting question in itself of how often do they get updated and do they reflect reality? So this is a um, this isn't something that has a public hearing. This is just uh, this is something that's done typically by the by the director of planning. Um, but we can um, we can provide comments, and I think that should at least to reflect what we've heard from the community. Thanks, Mike, for introducing. Any comments? First, second, or third comments? I guess what is the advantage to dividing it? Versus keeping it the way it is. Um, I, I don't know what particular goal is, and I think there's differences in the. If it would be a separate, it would be a separate piece of land that could be used in a different way to the rest of the land. Um, it can, it'll be a different thing as far as tax rolls is concerned. It could be in the future a different thing as far as ownership is concerned. So there's a number of advantages in the in in the, Replatting or doing a short plan. There are quite a lot of changes, but then that's just a, a short list of things. Okay. Thanks. Brian, your hand is up. Hi, thanks. Um, Brian, to address that question, um, the only code in within the Muni that directly addresses building within avalanche zones. Um, prohibits building within a high avalanche hazard zone. Um, and as I think folks have mentioned, this is in what's considered a moderate hazard avalanche zone. Those definitions are clearly defined by Art Mears in the 1982 study that he did that established these avalanche zones. Um, there's also a great paper from 1992 uh, where there was an avalanche hazard workshop within Anchorage to clarify the Art Mears study. Art Mears is a renowned avalanche um, expert in specifically in regards to 
uh, building in avalanche terrain. Um, so I think the specific advantage here, and this is just my personal opinion having looked at this, um, is that it very specifically carves this tract A, um, which is in the moderate hazard zone out of the high avalanche zone, which tract B remains in. And so if these two tracks stayed united, then as I read the code, and I'm just a layperson as far as code goes, then development would not be allowed in that area. However, I think that by subdividing it with this clearly um, uh, delineated subdivision that it it allows the developer to build in a moderate hazard zone. Um, and I guess the things that I think are important to note here is that moderate does not mean none. Um, there are a number of other residential buildings within that moderate hazard zone. Um, the difference with this lot is that it's um, it, it's it's in well it's written in the in the request as a uh, employee housing and so I think the question is you know individuals choose when they buy their home that's in the moderate hazard zone to do that do employees also make that conscientious decision is a question that I would have thanks thanks Ryan any other comments or questions from the board? Suggestions? Guy? Um, I guess we think there's going to be uh, uh, employee housing there. Is that correct? But there's no formal plans for that? That's what it says on the plan. I'll show you here. You scan in and get there, it says employee house. In the corner there. Yeah, so land uses. If someone online might be able to. Well, what kind of input are they, or what are they looking for? A, a letter? A, it's um it's just comments any comments on the yeah formal comments from gbls yeah or any member of the public larry do you have something to add i do um this is larry daniels i have uh, two comments one of which is uh, i believe that uh, recommendation that a uh, note to the plat um addressing the fact that the parcel is in a moderate avalanche zone. Uh, and I can tell you there are uh, uh, there's precedence for that. Uh, the day lodge when it was built, um, it was a requirement of its uh, permitting to identify it inside the building as well as to the plat uh, that it was in a moderate avalanche zone. Uh, my other comment would be that uh, uh, on <coughs> Large on uh, large crowd days, uh, several times this year already, um, there was substantial parking in the neighborhood uh, on public streets, many times where there really wasn't much uh, extra room. And I am a nearby neighbor, so I would be concerned about losing. There's at least a hundred parking spots that would be lost. Um, in um, in this development, so that's an, that's another hundred cars on public streets, um, making it difficult to access uh, property uh, for emergency vehicles and others. So those would be my two comments. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Jennifer, I just wanted to back up what Larry was saying on that because 
uh, we are seeing traffic all the way down these streets now, not just on the weekends, but like every military Monday, it's going down blocks away from the day lodge and and definitely these streets, I don't think are designed for that kind of uh, street parking. So I would agree with Larry, we, we already have a problem. So if we're going to subtract 100 cars, I have no idea where those cars are going to go. I suspect even farther into the neighborhoods that are already clogged. clogging. Thank you. Any other board comments? Um, we could continue to, it's a discussion, but if we would like to independently write, we that's probably a good option as well. We could also send something as a body and with the the items that we've heard, but we don't have formal meet a regular meeting before May 5th or May 15th to draft something. So or or waiting till then to, to do that. Um well I, I'm thinking too of I haven't been to that many resorts in the US, but they all have had had parking issues and then it turned into busing and lowering vehicles on the road. Everyone drives vehicles in Alaska, it seems like. Um, so that I feel like is whether the parking lot is there or not is and lots of vehicles. Grace, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, Brianna, um, I, I also want to um, uh, kind of go on the same path that Larry Daniels had shared with you. Um, at an acre and a half of which this um, disposal is being considered or this short plat is being considered, um, you're looking at a loss of approximately 187 parking spaces. And that is based on uh, the commercial calculation of a parking space being approximately 350 square feet. And so it's not just 100 spaces we're going to be losing of parking. It's approximately 187. And I think the this very significant issue here in the community as we address this, not only the avalanche question, but certainly the issue of life safety. And I think that one needs to be directed to our uh, police and fire service folks and EMT of how are they managing or being able to manage on high volume days at the resort and when we have this overflow and now taking away existing parking, uh, what does that mean to our community? I'm, I've I've seen at times when we have high volumes in Girdwood, um, vents that literally um, if I'm not mistaken, I've seen cars parked on the mountain itself. Uh, because not only have the uh, three parking lots in the day lodge been over maxed, um, they are literally parking cars on the mountain. So um, it is a concern. I think we should all be, you know, take uh, uh, addressing here and whether GBOS needs to send a letter um, in in regarding to this uh, request for the short plat. Um, I would recommend that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Jerry, I thought I saw your hand. You have something? Okay, uh, Mr. Nyman. Hi there. Um, yeah, I, I've looked at that issue for a while, like everyone else has, but I, I've noticed in some ski areas, what they'll do is they'll burrow into the side of the hill, and so you got their first tier, and then you, you're, you know, you got people on top, but they make, you can make more parking space into the hill. There's always. It's expensive. There's engineering design considerations. But it gives you sort of a bunker too, in a way, for the first guys who are under under the concrete. And then there's there's snow on top of it. You know, there can be either cars or snow on top of it. But you know, that's it's really we have limited space here, and and those more expensive solutions could be in the offing versus um, convincing people to take a bus from somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Kyle. Uh, so uh, I was contacted by the engineer who's working on this because um, we were discussing um, drainage uh, issues through there and one particular is that they will be abandoning the second entrance to that lot too um, and we had just uh, recently installed a fish culvert in there and if they do remove it 
we ask them to reopen the channel to, to uh, and we'll retain the materials that we put in for that project. Um, but my largest concern in that discussion was the parking uh, with this issue that we dealt with. Uh, we did reach out the uh, resort management this summer this winter about the parking issue and seeing if we could um, deal with it. We had an episode where the school bus took four turns to turn the corner on Loveland on a Monday um, and it was videotaped and, and we forwarded that on. Um, and one suggestion we had is uh, some better efficiency with parking. Um, I know it's a staffing issue at the resort and trying to get enough people to work and you know and you know for example at a fair people park cars tighter and and um and then also be up there you what screws up a weekend is when somebody decides to parallel park instead of um the way they should park and then everybody starts parking like that and then also uh tier three um and my suggestion was is to remove the boneyard up there and open up more parking in that location um and and just have some more efficiencies on site uh with parking uh, the engineer did tell me that he was tasked to look at expanding tier two and tier three for more parking um, with this development. Um, and so that's the last I heard of it uh, as for a comment back from them. But but uh, we have expressed those uh, those concerns and that was brought up at uh, the Public Safety Advisory Committee. And so our email was written about that. So so um, I think this resort is aware. When you say uh, we have expressed concerns, you do you mean as a formal comment to this plotting action? No, to this, to from staff to the Valley Esca Resort. Okay. We haven't. I I will. I'm planning to write the same comments within the uh, the comments section. Okay. The staff are requested for comments as well. So. Right. I mean that's that's effectively what we would do. Is there any advantage in us doing it as a board rather than you doing it as a service area manager? I don't think there is. If you're if you want to make the same comments, I don't know that it's we can we can also do them. Yeah, my comments will be mostly focused to the um, impact on parking. Okay, because I'm not trained in avalanche awareness or you know topography for that, so I'll be focused more on the public safety aspect of it. Okay. Question, uh, Brian. Um, I can kind of speak also to the to the parking situation there and and i know that that management at the at the resort has looked into where they can expand parking on that tier two and tier three tier three is a little tough because that dirt out there is being cured and if it's stable enough to park more on top of it um but as they um as they they work through a project there they'll probably be able to create some parking options also over by the base of Tanaka. I know that they're they're taking a look, you know, moving that tier two parking further into that zone right there. So I think there's some there's some options with parking. And a lot of the a lot of that end of the parking lot is actually more snow storage than than parking spaces. So they're gonna have to come up with a um, a snow storage plan that doesn't move the snow storage into adjoining parking areas. Thank you. Comments from the board. What's the will of the body on this item? If knowing that now I know Kyle's writing letter from as the Gurdus area manager and you can independently write letters or comments. Not um, I, I don't think there's any benefit in, in us as a board to doing it. I don't think we have quite enough information yet. Um, but if things happen, but this it does get um, plotted into something separate, and there is development there, then we have very specific concerns. They're very speculative. Should we keep this item on the agenda for next month? But next month it'll be too late. It's a, it's, it's only a one of the moment to it later. Right, it would be a different item. Okay, I'll move on to number sixteen community council boundary study which is in package and it has listed for us on the 
third, page 11, page of it. So the gems that they've listed. That's our third witness. District. Mike, would you like to speak to this? Um, yeah. So the, um, the uh, every 10 years, there's a exercise of going through all the community councils and uh, asking a question about the boundaries that are appropriate. Things changed. Um, this is a list or this document provides a list of all of the suggestions that have been made um, from surveys and individual comments. I think there were five comments about Turn Um Or sorry, there were five comments about good boundaries. Uh, one from um, Mark Butler at FCC, who was responding to um, several questions being asked him from, um, from community members, three from community members, and one from uh, Carol Hedford um, The language in the narrative of Section 4, I believe, is not quite accurate. Um, there is going to be a revision to it, or maybe this is the revised version. No, this is not. So there'll be a revision to this, which uh, so to reflect the, the actual situation closely. Um, there are four options which are presented here. I think technically there's a fifth, which could be, um, let's say option E, which could be um, that Procre is its own community council. I don't think anyone like, likely is going to want, want to do that because it would be very, very small, much smaller than other community councils. Um, other small community councils are being proposed as uh, to be abolished by portage. Um, but this is more for, for awareness. Um, if we want to make formal comments, we can. Um, this is currently, you know, what's, what's presented and what's in the document. Um, I'm just going to take a second just to reread this. There was something which wasn't quite accurate in the description. Oh, yes. The, um, the last sentence on the first column says persons living outside of GBO service area and part of the community council district cannot vote for the community council organization that re represents the GBOS land use committee. Of course, people outside GBO service, the Gobi Valley service area can vote um, for people who represent them in land use. They are full voting members of land. So that statement is inaccurate and uh, could be revised in a future version of this document. Do you have Mike and so far in your since learning of this last week? Do you have any feeling on which of these A or D they might choose? I think no, no, no I don't know. The um I would say one for option C is also not quite an accurate description of what you have to do. So if you expand the boundaries of the service area, that would have to that would have to be a vote. Um mm -hmm. both the existing service area and the annexed area, which would be Upper Crow Creek, and they would be voting to uh, become part of the service area and pay the associated taxes for the service area. Um, you can, I'll leave it as an exercise for other people to decide whether that vote is likely to pass or not in Crow Creek if they wanted mm -hmm. to do that. Um, but I would say if you know if Crow Creek wanted to wanted to do that, then that would be a separate activity from the boundary changes for community councils. But because that is one of the options, option C is basically a public vote. Um, it does kind of pose the question of, you know, the others just in position from outside. Well, make no change or, uh, you know, people from outside the community make the decision for us. Um, and one of the options is actually a public vote. So, I mean, if, I would say if there is going to be a boundary change, we should probably, I would recommend something that has, a, has an actual pocket mandate for doing so and have a vote on it. So that's a personal opinion. I, I got a question about it. If you okay. So that the next step in your community council's roles, it says it's um, they're going to create this um, draft report and recommendations. That hasn't been done yet, right? So this this was written on March fifteenth, and so that hasn't been done yet. And then there'll be a two month public comment period after that, um, for formal comments and. So, and then I'll hold a public hearing this week. We could wait, or we could advise against two of the options. 
Uh, but I feel like speaking on behalf of members that aren't in the GBS or the GBSA areas. Really an attribute. Yeah, I think what we my sense is said there were some inaccuracies in this and there was information missing. So I've had um, I reached out to um, Tom Davis who wrote this. We had a discussion. He's going to fix things which are wrong um, and re produce a version which is more accurate. Um, and I think after that, then we can we can probably either comment on that or wait until there's a recommendation which comes up. And individually, again, we can make comments. On this anyway. Okay. I like that idea. Uh, that sounds quite sensible at this point. Not updated. Any other comments? I okay. agree with that. Okay. We'll move on then. I will. Number 17, assembly short term rental assembly STR work session from April 7th. The PowerPoint is in the packet that Randy Solt worked on. And we, I don't know what the action or so actually, I've done. Is our assembly member still on? Randy, are you still on? here? I am yeah. still here. After ten. <laughs> Can I? Yes, please. Thanks, Randy. Um, I know you. Um, yeah, it's very late. Um, although it's a, it's not late for an assembly meeting, is it? This is still earlier, but you're just still late. early. Yeah. Still got, <laughs> you've got to the end of the consent agenda by now. Um, <laughs> Speaking of which, I think you have to make a motion to extend the meeting. Oh, actually, sorry, yes, we, might. we actually won't move past 10 o'clock. Sorry, we just had to do something for But so move to extend your turn until 10 30. Okay, we have a motion to extend, hopefully not till 10 30, but till 10 30. Do you have a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Thanks, Guy. Any objections? <laughs> okay, continuing on. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, could you just, um, I know in the presentation you, um, you said a couple of things about Goodwood, and I just wondered if you could just summarize um, where this, where the, um, where the actual ordinance is, and uh, whether you whether you think this would have, whether this would apply. Well, whether you think right. it should as is to Goodwood, or whether there should be some additional work and some additional changes from us. Yeah, so I so I, I went into this um, looking to push short term rentals to to create more houses, and I've kind of come out of it a different place. Um, if you look at the presentation, where I'm at is probably what I would support is a very simple permitting model that protects the um, the enjoyment of the renter as well as the peaceful enjoyment of the surrounding community. So it essentially gives the municipality a bigger stick. And I think that's true for most of Anchorage. Um, Girdwood's probably, Girdwood is more unique given that it's a resort community and, and you will have a housing problem and and I and we've seen in other resort communities, you could probably buy a million dollar home, put it into STR service, and it'd still pencil out. So would I ever if I ever get the AO back from legal, um, what I would like to do is share it with GBOS. You could take a look at those potential ideas that have consequences either way. There's certainly um, examples where they've pushed short-term rentals back into housing, which were the only way that owners were getting the extra income to be able to keep that house or an ADU that they rented out that enabled them to keep that house and get it by. So there's certainly negative consequences. So I, I kind of got back to a, more of a free market approach. The market will eventually adjust itself. And if someone builds a house with the intent to rent it as an SDR, at least they're still building the house. It may not be an SDR later today. So I I'll tell you the truth, I'm really nervous about doing anything with Girdwood. Um, what I'd rather have is is have Girdwood look at the potential levers that other communities have used, and if you feel there should be legislation, we can tack it onto this as like an overlay district. So, uh, do you have any sense of when we may see that AO? I think I've asked you this many times. Yeah, it's it's been it's been sitting with Dean for almost for probably over two months now. Um, what I'll probably do is just ask for it back from him so I can have the latest copy. 
Um, I know he's updated the code sections where it would belong, and I can go ahead and make the adjustments to it to make it to where it is just a simple permitting process with language for an overlay district. Um, we can even have the leverage in there that's a lot easier just to cross them out what you'd want, what you don't want. And then if Gerber wanted to be an overlay district, we could do that. But again, my my thought process is it's a very it's a very it's a double edged sword. Hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's something you have to be careful with because this, you know, it, it's easy to it would be easy through a mechanical process to say keep with a free for all or ban them all. But obviously there was the reality has to be some a, a sensible solution has to be somewhere in between the two. And that's a difficult button. Right. Um, I mean, we can open, when you say overlay district, we've also got chapter nine, which covers the whole of Girdwood anyway. So uh, if it's enacted within chapter nine, then um, we have a lot of things which are separate from the rest of uh, Title 21. Yep. So if it's done so within, within 21, is that actually how the AO is structured? Is it uh, changed within Title 21 or elsewhere? Uh, that's what we're looking at was Title 21. That's why that's why the Dean has it to make sure it's a applicable to the relevant code, but of course, Girdwood, you're right. We just put it in the Girdwood section and that would cover it. Yep. OK, thanks. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we should see the AI. Yes. Thank you. OK, thanks, Mike, for having that. Thank you, Randy, for still being here and discussing it with us and all of your work on this. Um, you're welcome. Anything else we're going to for now? Okay. Okay. Number 18. Yeah, 412. 12. 12 revisited. Thank you. Um, so now that we've had the other conversations, um, I think it's going to be easier for us to talk about the Muni Manager meeting. We do have um, confirmation that um, Kent Cole Hayes is expecting us. And today, because uh, posting of this meeting was required, what we posted were items one through four and five, six and seven were left off. So um, and the reason for that being that we had not discussed them. Um, they landed on this tentative agenda just because they were swirling around with land use and, and then here today. So um, what I have heard in the conversation so far is that item number one, um, we now have the letter that we'll be sending, although I think you're only planning on sending it to Lance Wilbur, not the Assembly Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee of the whole. Um, but we could talk about that. Um, and then as a separate item there, the sewer line. So we'll discuss the letter. We can discuss the uh, resolution that you also provided. And the sewer line as three separate topics under Girdwood housing concerns, as well as introducing that we're working on a, a subcommittee. That sound good? Adding that one. Um, I don't have uh, any new language for item number two, GBSA seeking assistance with the Girdwood Industrial Park needs, although we We'll be adding the. We want to discuss it that. Yeah, it could be add specifically the um, there's issues of accessing. Permit permitted sites. There's issues of um, infrastructure, particularly electricity, and then there's still the question of the long term plan. There are other issues as well, but they will fall under those main three, I think. OK. So we might be emailing tomorrow just to make sure that I get it right. Um, cemetery bonding in 2024. Still want to have that. Is that verbiage OK so far? I don't know if you talked to Tommy today, so do you say seeking assistance? Yeah, well, and this is with the OMB director. I think where we left it last was with legal. So this is a different conversation. I think we should be clear about what you're seeking. So if there is something that you need OMB to do, um, usually OMB jumps in after the bond language is written and um, they just clarify how that's going to work. Could we ask that Bill Falsey's there for free? 
uh, Bill Falls is not an employee of the municipality, so they can't request Bill Falls to be there. He's a contractor of the assembly. So assembly could request. Yeah, so you have to work with an assembly member to have him there. They'd be paying for his time too. Is that because there's a there's a specific I thought, on making everyone? Yes, and I thought he was starting to work on it instead of Dean Gates. Because Dean still hasn't written the memo about the area wide book finding he had. Yeah, that might be a discussion that happens with the assembly members because I think that's in the yeah. report and that and the administration will put it over to the assembly to deal with it. So that might be. And it will be the new our new representative. Correct. Well, with Zach and Randy probably figuring out what's going on with that. It sounds like Dean's behind on a lot of the AOs. So, um, so yeah, I think given the, given when this would when the bond process is later in the year. I, I wonder if it makes sense just to not have it on this month and then uh, on this quarters and then to bring it back to the quarter maybe. I was going to mention that probably later in the year would be a good yeah. time to bring it up. Right, and our next meeting with them is in July. Okay. And then hopefully the Goodwood Cemetery Committee can work out those issues yeah. directly. And then um, if you need the municipal manager to be involved, you know, we can get to back to their meeting, but we may be able to resolve that outside of this meeting. I appreciate that guidance and I'm okay with removing number three. Okay. Um, the possibility of increasing transfer station hours and staffing. May I advise that we probably put that one on hold. There's a transition in leadership there right now and um, they're just trying to keep things operational. And I know that they've fixed a lot of the problems, even hired local uh, for operations down there. So, um, we want to see if somebody new comes in permanent because the acting director probably will not make any changes at this point in time. I'm amenable for that as well. Okay, and then that gives us the three possible new items. Um, again, I don't uh, five and six. I don't think. Uh, reasonable topics for this meeting. Great. And I'm not sure that. I don't think boundary thing is a, is a boundary is a uh, municipal. Is a, is a municipal manager item either, so I don't think any of those make sense. Great. And then we talked about adding as a separate item just for GBOS at the end, the power to the industrial park lot. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, yeah, so that would follow. Right away, right after. Two. Yeah, usually at that point we could let the manager go and then just finish business. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's an example of the problems we're facing from earlier, so it's good to have it on. Correct. I think we can bring it up an earlier and showing what we're trying to accomplish. And item number two. Yes. Yeah. So you want to have the GBOS vote on it and item number two or come back? No, I think we have it at the end. Yes. Yeah, we but do. we'll discuss it during item number two to show good. the plans that we're trying to accomplish. Sounds good. Is there anything else that you'd like to do to refocus and target any of these points? I think being really respectful of the fact that we have limited municipal staff that are going to be there. We'll be having uh, Mr. Cole Hayes, Mr. Wilbur. I think just really making sure that we are focused and strategic in the conversations, making sure that we have direct asks. I think the letter helps. Yes, thank you. Guy? I had a question. How can we are going to sit into this so to make to Mrs. Altal and um and the other one in the oversight committee? It sounded like that's where they make the decision. That decision on that. I think we just haven't talked about exactly the routing of that letter yet. I think it's reasonable to uh, send it to the two chairs of the oversight committee. Yeah. Oversight. And what about to the HLB themselves? Or the HLB AC themselves? Um, like the chair? Yeah, maybe uh, that probably makes sense. The chair of it. So we'll talk off yeah. about how to do that. I don't think that. 
Anyway, well, good job. You've trimmed your agenda from uh, potential seven items to two. <laughs> and I will, <laughs> and I will be providing a briefing to the city manager and uh, director Holbert. So um, I'll be working on that tomorrow so they can prepare to be prepared for this meeting. So okay. yeah. uh, you know, the question about a sewer line, is that likely to bring in anyone from Maywood? Uh, I would suggest that they probably bring in somebody from Maywood in their capital projects. And I get rid of this. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. better. No, it's good. Okay. Thank you for making that possible, everyone. Going to new business number 18 Timberline Road improvements to Alpina and Vale Loveland intersections staff. Right. This is my opportunity to hit on this because right now we see the road in the worst condition of the year. And, um, uh, we did not have success with those state grants. They weren't supportive of it because we didn't really have a full design document ready with cost estimates, whereas they really loved our culverts because we had done all the work and had all plans and engineer estimates all completed. So I do think we need to take a hard look at this internally um, and do those steps of having uh, a shovel ready project and we pay up front with the design work and get the engineer estimates completed um and do that so once again i've asked the pate company to come up with a, a cost proposal which they are working on now we're actually doing a site visit this week and then we're going to do a site visit after full meltdown and then we're going to look out of that and they're going to come back at us with a proposal we looked at this in 2016 um and i presented to the board the board was lukewarm about it so we didn't move forward but i think we're back here again and uh we recognize it as a capital improvement for, for our community that's briefly needed so I'll be coming back up with you with a proposal in the coming month. I don't want to extend the meeting too long, but the um, in, in that proposal, are they going to are they going to um, build to full collector standard according to code, or is or is that what they're going to um, propose in terms of the design? They're going to look at what the uh, minimum standards are that we need to, to accomplish within that. Not, we need by code, or we need by function. By uh, the can be a mixture of what's required by code and by function, um, you know, because uh, we end up being funding in our project. We have to take a what can we afford to do? Yeah. You know? Okay. So, so yeah, full collector standard um, probably would not be, and that's been an issue I've discussed, you know, in the sense of like separated pathways and things like that. We have a major snow storage issue problem in that section of road, and uh, we wouldn't be able to maintain an open pathway in the middle of summer winter. So we have to store that stuff somewhere. Mm -hmm. so, so those things are all being uh, discussed in that aspect. So maybe a two po two point proposal, which shows you here's a high end, here's a low end. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, number nineteen, garbage fire request for new two place trailer fire department. So uh, this is in response to an incident that we had. Uh, one of the trailers was buried back here in the corner and when the loader went in to clear it, he didn't see it and he caught the front end of it, and broke it off. And uh, and so uh, Western is replacing the um, trailer that they broke and it's $1,500 value. Um, but in order to replace uh, the trailer that they do need for their storage of their snow machines, um, the total is about $3,200. So we're asking to use the um, to make up the rest of the funds out of the capital fund to uh, replace that trailer. Um, trailers are in stock, so we can buy one anytime. We just need the approval to move forward on it. So, so we'll be talking more about that next month's meeting as it's new business. So, how come Western's not replacing the full amount? They're replacing the value of the piece of equipment that they broke. So like you get a car accident and you replace the value of the car that was broken, not what you want to buy in that aspect. But we had it appraised and that's what it came down. Thanks. Anything else from the board? Any motion to adjourn? I just I wanted to point out that in the reports at the end of the packet, there's one from the Girdwood Library and um, the acting manager, Ambler Stevenson, who has been in his acting role for some time, is likely to be stepping down as they're starting interviews for the new Girdwood branch manager. So I wanted to 
make sure that you are aware of that so that if you are through the library, you can thank him for stepping into that role. Where's that? Like the library, back here, library back. report is before the J Bear report. Okay. On the other or J -Bear. side of a very yeah. picture. Okay, Margaret. Yeah. yeah. And the new couch is awesome. The new couch. I saw that somewhere. Okay. Yep. Seed exchange, good things going on, but especially <laughs> to thank him for his help. Margaret. Okay, I don't see any other reports. Is there anything else? For 30. We have a motion to adjourn. Second? Second, second. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. Uh, I, I bet myself I could say.